What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to Reborn a Soccer with a Gamer Interface, part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. By the time the waterbenders came and clashed against the Fire Nation soldiers, Sokka had killed many of them already, and it had been a massacre. Sokka seemed a little injured, but overall seemed to be well. But the ground was drowned in blood with a river of red corpses, terrified faces of the people, flames, and the murky smell of despair reeked all around. Looking at the corpses in the ground, even the Water Tribe soldiers couldn't help but gulp in fear and respect. Somewhere horrified as amongst the Fire Nation soldiers were those that had died with their eyes open, and it felt like they were staring back at them. Not anyone can just go and do something like this. How many do you think are there? Seems like at least 50. Damn, that's a lot. Though they spoke in lowered voices, Sokka could hear them. Thinking about killing people and then doing it were two different things. Even he was grossed out and a little perturbed by the corpses. If it wasn't for Gamer's mind he would have thrown up due to the smell. It was truly horrible. His sense of guilt clawed at his heart as each of these people had a family, sibling, mother, children. Everyone had someone waiting for them. But as soon as it came, Sokka crushed that guilt with ruthless ferocity. He couldn't let himself think about that, or he would end up becoming miserable. Not even Gamer's mind would be able to help him against himself. Gather the corpses and burn the bodies. They can't be returned to their families in that condition anyway. But Dash don't worry. I know they won't attack for a little bit. Sokka reassured the men, and just like he had said, the Fire Nation ships seemed to come to a halt. There was no doubt in his heart that Azula had seen what he had done. And even while she might be angry at him, the princess wouldn't be reckless to send more troops into a slaughterhouse. Sokka was confident in Azula, and knew that she might come up with a good plan to take care of him. But for now, he also could somewhat guess where she would move and what she would do. Opening his notifications, Sokka sees that there were multiple of them, notifying him that his intelligence had increased by three, and wisdom by two for outmaneuvering competent commanders, and a genius strategist Azula. Intelligence, 43 to 46, wisdom, 30 to 33. He waved at the waterbenders and pointed towards the destroyed walls. Be careful and always keep guard. Or before we ever know it, the Northern Water Tribe will be slaughtered. After that, Sokka picks one of the younger men and whispers in his ear. Have the civilians move to the back of the Water Tribe. The Fire Nation will have no mercy on them either, and soon catapult shots will start coming. Then he walked off. Sokka planned to butcher as many people as the Fire Nation threw at him until they eventually gave up, and the Fire Nation's people's spirits broke. By the time Azula realized that Sokka didn't need sleep or rest, it should be too late. Even to him, the plan wasn't too reliable. But Sokka didn't have a lot of time to do anything, and most of his effort was spent taking care of certain people. That would have grown to be troublesome. Still, he didn't have time or the manpower to prepare something fearsome against Azula and her massive army. For all he knew, Azula could realize that he didn't need sleep and rest much sooner, and that would have the plan come crumbling down. There is another way. But I did not want to do it. Sokka contemplated, and the faces of the people he had killed came to mind. Someone like him didn't mind killing too much. But it made him feel sorry for the people they would leave behind. The one who dies only experiences despair for a second. But those they leave behind will be affected by their death for the rest of their lives. Without a working father, the children wouldn't be able to eat. And what about their mother? There were many things a mother would do for her children, and there weren't a lot of things women could do freely at this time. Fire Nation accepted women as soldiers. But would a mother be able to join the army and leave her children alone? There was one option that a woman and mother in that position could do, and that was prostitution. The children would be affected and bullied for that. Each person Sokka killed today. He wasn't naive enough to not understand all of this, and what he was doing by killing these people. Ding. For understanding the pain you're causing the people you kill, intelligence increased by one Sokka clenched his teeth, and his hand formed into a tight fist. But he released a sigh as he walked away. What a shitty system. You don't need to remind me of what I am doing here. I am not killing evil people either. Just some men and women who want to make a living and have no other choice. Due to comprehending that just because someone is your enemy, it doesn't make them evil, wisdom increased by one fuck you. He swore under his breath, and walked towards a certain secret passage. But he stopped once he noticed someone following him. You can come out now, Katara. Next time try to breathe softer, and soften your steps by using waterbending. He noticed her due to having that pulled up, but he still gave her some genuine advice. Though Katara wouldn't be able to hide from the map no matter what. Katara came out of one of the turns in the tunnels behind Sokka. And she walked next to him. Sokka finally was able to get the smell of blood from his nostrils, and smelled the perfume that his sister had put on herself or shampoo. He didn't know what it was. 
but it helped him get rid of that gross, bloody, smell of death. Are you okay? She asked him, worriedly, Katara had seen what her brother caused. While Ahn had been conflicted on the matter, she knew what to think of her brother. It wasn't your fault, this is a war. If it was anyone else, she would have been afraid to approach them. But Sokka was her brother. He was family, and no matter what he did, she wouldn't feel scared of him. He sighed at her words and smiled slightly. Do you think I will break down after killing people? Don't worry, your brother isn't that weak. I can do a lot more than you think. Katara felt a chill go down her spine as a feeling of coldness surrounded her. Still, she only took a deep, cold breath and calmed herself. Deciding to change the subject, she asked, Where are we going? Sokka smiled at that. Some place where I can end all of this. Sister, I am never sure if you ever noticed this, but I am a very selfish person. I don't compromise for other people, and am vain enough to not change myself for others. His smile turned into a gentle one, something that she was familiar with. I don't like killing so many people. More specifically, I don't like how the people that they leave behind end up. Should I change myself to fit this world and my ambitions? A great man once said, you can choose as you want, but your wants are chosen for you. Katara was confused at where her brother might have met someone like that, or which book he read it from. But Sokka continued as they both noticed the light at the end of the secret tunnel they were in. We are not free in what we do, because we are not free in what we want. But as a selfish person, I once suddenly he stopped and his smile slipped off his face and he patted Katara, ruffling her hair. Someday you will understand just how much we lack choice. Some are okay with that, I am not. The more he spoke, the more confused Katara became. It felt like he was trying to tell her something, but stopped himself. After walking out of the secret passage, there was a bush blocking their way, and the light was past that. They walked out, and Katara was surprised by the greenery around her. But this was something she remembered having visited before. Sokka went and stood in front of the pond, Katara followed, and saw that he was staring at two fish chasing each other. Her brother sat down, cross-legged and in a meditative pose. Katara glanced at her brother, as his body slumped, and she immediately went and let his body lean on her, and gently laid him on the ground. Noticing he no longer had his spear with him, where did he put it? She wondered, but not for long, and just laid his head down and used her lap as a pillow. What is going on inside this head? She smiled, gently rubbing his hair, before a mischievous look came to her face and she disheveled his hair like he always did with hers. Usually, he would never allow something like this to happen. Suddenly she noticed that the eyes of the dark fish started shining, pulling her out of any petty thoughts. The way the fish's eyes shone reminded Katara of Aung's avid estate. At the same time, Sokka opened his eyes grudgingly, as if awakening from a deep slumber. Getting up, he was in a luxurious room, though there was no shining gold around. The room was big and extravagant, with the bed and the sheets he was covered in being silky to the touch. He clenched his teeth, this was a part of his memory he didn't want to visit, but knew that this was unavoidable. MHH a feminine gentle moan sounded next to him, and Sokka felt his heart clutch at his throat as if he was about to suffocate, barely able to breathe. She had bright blue eyes, full of life, flowing dark hair, and pale and glistening sweat glued to her body. This only made her even more enticing. Wyatt, why are you up so early? Sokka stared at her for a couple of seconds. The name sounded so unfamiliar to his ears. But he knew this was his previous name. He felt his heartbeat increase like a loud drum, about to burst his ears. Ivy the name was just so, but he decided to do what he had come here for. Sorry, I gotta go. He got up and the sheet was stripped from his body, showing a well-built body. But it was all for aesthetic purposes, as Sokka knew that this body wasn't anything special. He started walking off, not minding his nakedness. Are you going to leave me again? The woman's voice was like sweet honey, as if she was whispering in his ears. Sokka stopped for a split second and turned around, and got close to her, a tear rolled down his face. Sorry, but I am the kinder guy who doesn't like giving his life for someone else. He kissed her on the forehead and walked off. Also, it would be weird to try and replace you with an imaginary version that was made by my mind. She chuckled, cold as always. Wyatt, did you ever love me? Yes, Sokka nodded. You're the woman I have loved the most and regret what happened between us. But I am in a whole new world now. I can't have myself be obsessed with the past so much. What a cruel man, she chuckled. You're not willing to let yourself feel something even in the land of imagination. Are illusions supposed to admit to being an illusion? He inquired curiously simultaneously opening the doors of the room that were unnecessarily big and beautifully decorated. But on the other side of the door was just a dark abyss. Sokka sighed and closed them. Turning around he sat down on the ground, staring at the woman with an amused smile on his face. So is this some kind of spiritual trial? One where I see my mistakes and admit to them while weeping in pain. And beg for forgiveness. I do have a lot of regrets in my past life, but didn't think you would pop up. Why? Am I not that important to you? She said jokingly, sighing while looking at her hand. Yes, the woman smiled knowingly as she got up, the cloth bouncing off her bountiful chest, and she stood naked. Looking at her own body, she smiles. Wow, you remember every detail. Actually, no, your breasts are bigger than they used to be. Always wanted them to be bigger. 
But with you being my sugar mama, I couldn't say that to your face before, Sokka shrugged, as if this wasn't himself he was talking about. The smile slipped off the woman's face as she peered at him like a hawk. You will be stuck here forever if you don't face your problems. Only then will you be able to gain a mental connection and contact the ocean spirit. Suddenly, as he thought of how to solve this, Sokka smiled and looked at her. So does this mindscape have a time dilation? It was a very cliche thing. So he had to ask. Yes, one minute outside is ten here, she answered, confused at what he was getting at. That's cliche, he whispered, but the smile on his face only got wider. He tried to access his inventory, but it didn't open. Oh, right, I am inside my spirit and mind here. He went towards the bed and kicked it. Bam. His leg shattered the wood as if it was nothing, and he made a makeshift spear out of the wood. Well, tell me when about an hour passes, or ten hours in here. Because I am about to use this time to train. This wasn't made for that. The ritual is sacred where one comes to understand themselves. See that they are human dash. Okay, okay, okay. Sokka waved her off as if she was just an annoying brat. Wait, I will get back to my spiritual awakening and understanding. After I finish this training. Because I barely have any time to train outside. She frowned but didn't stop him. The ocean spirit will be waiting too. Are you sure you want to keep him waiting? He is immortal. He has the time to wait. Not like he has anything better to do anyway. Hours passed. And the ocean spirit was waiting outside in the dark space for hours. Unlike the harmless fish that was his physical form, his spirit form was that of a gigantic, humanoid, koi fish that seemed to be made of water. As one of the strongest spirits in existence, even when Rava and Vati used to roam the lands, neither would try to mess with him. Not because they couldn't beat him, but he wasn't someone you wanted as an enemy. After 10 hours of waiting, Sokka's spiritual form started appearing, and he was a combination between Sokka. But he was taller, his body better built. The ocean spirit's gaze shined down on him, and immediately a connection was formed between the two of them. I see that your spiritual trial took quite a long time, said the ocean spirit, speaking through his soul. And it seemed like the dark abyss around them seemed to rumble. It must have been a heavy trial of regrets and pain. Sokka's body went rigid for a second, and he slowly nodded. Yes, it was a very hard trial. There are a lot of regretful things I have done in my life. Of course, Sokka took this opportunity and played out his feelings to the maximum, and looked down sadly, a tear rolling down his face. Yes, life sometimes can be unfair. The ocean spirit nodded, assuming that the young man had been through a lot of pain and trial. So his reason to go through that pain must be very noble. I feel like he is misunderstanding why I was in there for so long. While what happened to her was regretful, she wouldn't want me to wail on and be depressed about her death. If we had changed places... I would want the same for her. Life goes on. Playtime always comes to an end. Sokka's smile turned melancholic at the thoughts of his past life. Sometimes hookups can turn into more than one intended. Talking like this to spirits was something fantasy-like, wondrous, and Sokka could feel the overwhelming presence of La. It was like an invisible weight was pushing down on him, but was unlike gravity. There was a weight to it. The closest sensation he could describe it was as if the air had noticeable weight, and blood was heavier, and you could feel it moving through your veins. This was caused due to the difference between the size of their spiritual energy, or as some might call it Kai. Sokka's gamer interface interpreted it as mana points. It's strange, rumbled the spirit of the ocean. I couldn't see your trial at all, or even look at your mind. Sokka seemed to contemplate what he said, but he knew that it was gamer's mind protecting him. But there was one thing that he wanted to know. Knowing that gamer's mind had a limit, Sokka feels curious to know just where that limit stood. The reason he had made it so far even when spirits seemed to pay attention and scheming against him was all because he had picked his fights carefully. There had been some surprises along the way, but life never was that predictable, and he had been able to handle things. Would you have been able to enter forcefully? The spirit of the ocean tilted his giant fish head. Its monstrous look made it hard to read his face or what it was thinking. I feel like you're hiding something. A chill went down Sokka's spine when he heard those words. But he smiled and nodded. Yes, I am hiding a couple of things. But everyone has some things they don't want to be known by anyone else. Those deep secrets. Even you have secrets, right? Lars mouth opened and since he was made out of water, he had a translucent look. But Sokka could somewhat make out a smile. It was quite difficult to read the spirit's expressions. True, we all have our secrets. La opened his watery palm, and it formed a ball of light. It showed him the scenes of what was happening outside. Outside, the Fire Nation princess will attack again soon. Tell me, why are you here? Sokka noticed that the ocean spirit didn't answer whether he would be able to break through his gamer's mind. But Sokka dropped the subject and didn't bring it up. It was obvious to him that La didn't seem in the mood to talk about it. He changed the subject before, and calling him out on it didn't sound like a good idea. I need your help. Seeing that he wouldn't be able to trick the ocean spirit, Sokka decided to be honest. He thought that the initial misunderstanding might make this easier, but only by a little. Seems like the ocean spirit wasn't the kind to bother or feel pity for humans, whose problems and lives might seem insignificant over the years. The Fire Nation is attacking the Northern Water Tribe. I can't stop them all. Human war isn't something spirits interfere with. The ocean spirit seemed to think about something, and then the aura around him got even heavier. I saw the battle you had against them. He narrowed his eyes that were just two light circles in the spirit's watery body. 
body. To me, it seemed like with the help of others, as long as they didn't surround you would be able to kill many more Fire Nation soldiers. It's not that easy, Sokka shook his head. A reputation of a massacring madman isn't something that I want. Nobody likes monsters. No human should hold that amount of power and be in a position of leadership. There was a reason why the Avatar didn't become a nation leader. No one liked a godlike power being in charge. Sokka wasn't at that level yet. But in the eyes of the people, truth didn't matter that much. Rumors are likely to grow and make it seem like he was stringer than he is. Hum the ocean spirit crouched down, and Sokka seemed like a minuscule bug next to him. It was like a human crouching down to stare at a bug. To me, it feels like you're more worried about your plans going wrong. I have lived for many millennia, and countless humans have requested my help and I have observed many leaders. How do I know that you aren't trying to use me for your nefarious deeds? Sokka glanced down, the dark abyss almost seemed to look right back at him, narrowing his eyes, it felt like he saw someone. His eyes sharpened for a split second and sighed. Sokka's gaze seemed to peer into the giant spirit. I didn't want to do this, but I would suggest you do this favor for me. Sometimes, bad things could happen to harmless fish. Did you just threaten me? Boom. Space crackled, the light stopped, darkness eroded. A blinding dark blue light came out of the ocean spirit's body. You dare threaten me Sokka's body was blasted backward, the ocean spirit was going to crush his spirit destroying his existence. But Sokka seemed to luckily escape. It was as if fate itself was bending to his benefit. A smile adorned his face when he saw this. Just as I thought, we are still somewhat inside my body. The ocean spirit looked on in wonder as all of his energy seemed to move away from Sokka. Not even a scratch was in his soul even though he was attempting to crush the human. La had lived for thousands of years. So he wasn't incompetent when it came to using his spiritual energy and powers. But right now, he seemed very incompetent. Like a trained boxer unable to land a hit on a small, unmoving child. Stumbling before hitting him, there was a chance of that happening. But it had an astronomical low chance of happening repeatedly. The difference between the two was insurmountable, something that Sokka wouldn't be able to close even in a hundred years. Yet even now, La couldn't land a hit. For the first time in hundreds of years he felt angry, someone threatened him and the moon spirit. Yet, they were unable to do anything. Sokka stood up, a calm smile on his face even as the mighty spirit roared, enraged at him. Is that it? He asked with an unimpressed look. Well, while you can easily defeat me, I probably seem like a bug to you. Yet you'll never be able to kill or harm me. What Sokka wanted to do was test certain theories. And he was right. As long as it isn't in the real world, and is in a way like in his mind or spirit, then his luck stat will be able to directly affect the mental world around him. In the real world, the ocean spirit was just a fish, and unless he fused with An, he wasn't a threat to Sokka. Even if he tried to kill Sokka by spirit, luck would make it essentially impossible to do so, as he would have to enter a zone where his luck was in full effect. You should have accepted the deal, Sokka said honestly. We could have worked together and both benefited from the deal. Instead, I had to threaten you. And since you became my enemy I can't let you go. He looked down. The presence that he thought he saw previously was now gone. So he started walking in the dark space. His steps seemed to claim into the darkness. While you might not be able to directly kill me, you could have some other spirit do it for you. Or you might kill my cute little sister as revenge. That would piss me off. Just the thought of her death because of me makes my stomach twist. I am sure you understand, imagine if someone killed the moon spirit. Yes, that's the kind of anger I would feel, and that isn't good at all. As Sokka was talking, he walked towards the powerful spirit. Boom, boom, boom. Bursts of energy burst through like wave, but Sokka nonchalantly walked past the attacks, none even grazing him. Even as La tried to kill him, it was ineffective as it felt like some kind of invisible energy was around him, twisting the attacks away from him. Not only is anger bad for health, I don't like myself when I get angry. My parents were always angry, mad at why life was messing them up dash. You talk too much. Yelled out the moon spirit, who on the sound rang out like a loudspeaker right next to his ear. Sokka felt like the sound alone would burst his eardrums, but a gentle wisp of strange wind carried the sound away. That was dangerous. Better finish this up. I have no idea how long the luck stack can keep me safe in this. Sokka concluded and got ready to put his plan into action. This was another theory he had, but suddenly he felt a chilly presence behind him. His spine felt like ice, as if ice had been poured into his brain. Sensation fades, and within a blink, the energy around him overturned back to his body. I knew you would show up. The ocean and the moon spirit always seemed inseparable. His body felt like it was floating, and light seemed to escape his eyes. I see that you plan this, a frosty feminine voice sounded behind him. But no matter how much you plan things, there will be outward interference that will ruin everything. Especially when you don't know anything. The moon spirit had the humanoid form of a long silver haired woman with white pale skin, blue eyes, and long silver eyelashes. She is the kind of beauty that seems so perfect that most would assume that it is fake. There was simply no imperfection on her body. Sokka turned around, feeling his heart start beating faster once he saw her. Truly the most beautiful woman in the world and even top models would pale in comparison. But that feeling was gone as soon as it came. He wasn't the kind of guy that would let his life be ruined by lust. Well, I thought you would just be a big translucent moon. She narrowed her eyes. Is that all you have to say after threatening my life? 
No, if I knew you were a beautiful woman, I would have never done that. Sokka cringed inwardly at the words that were coming out of his mouth. It was during these moments that the acting skill made itself useful. Except when killing the evil lady, heavily injuring Azula, and massacring some female Fire Nation soldiers. I didn't harm women. Yeah. I was bullshitting her here. Sokka would kick a beautiful woman in the face without a second thought if they got in his way. But of course, he had to keep up his gentlemanly demeanor. Who didn't like a gentleman? Everyone did. Though he had a feeling that the moon spirit already knew the kind of man he was. His experience in dealing with thousands of year old women was lacking, to say the least. Unlike the young, impressionable women he had charmed until now, his attempts this time were useless as Tui. The moon spirit sent him a cold glare. Literally, as the tip of his fingers started freezing as she kept looking at him. I should destroy your existence for speaking like. A human who hasn't even lived two decades assumes that he knows everything there is to the world. I never claimed that. Admittedly, there is very little I know about this world, especially spirits. He admitted his smile slipping off. But aren't you the ones being arrogant? Just because you have lived thousands of years. Don't assume you know everything. Or that age somehow makes you wiser than others. With age comes wisdom, young man, Tui snorted, showing her clear annoyance at his words. Oh yeah, I am sure that there is a lot of experience and wisdom to be had in swimming in a pond for thousands of years, Sokka added sarcastically. He wasn't going to back down, or show fear here. This was his domain, and the two spirits seemed unaware of where Sokka's power was coming from. In his eyes, they were the ones being naive here. Still, Tui had a chilly energy burst out of her that made him feel full and weightless, as if a balloon full of helium, and about to pop. The power of the moon was overwhelming Sokka's body, but he didn't show an ounce of fear. Like before, a strange, non-existent force seemed to come out of nowhere, and a rift opened in space, causing the moon spirit's aura to disperse, as soon as it got close to harming Sokka. Even the tips of his finger that were frozen returned to normal. What was that? Tui muttered, feeling like she lost connection to her energy for a split second. The existence of such a force battle them. It seemed like an ant blocking a human foot from stepping on them. It made no sense. Sokka suddenly swung his arm, and even he seemed to be surprised as a sudden unnatural force burst out pushing back even the two powerful spirits. That was when space seemed to warp. Crack! The space around him started to break as a sudden tremor appeared, and he got a killer headache as if someone was drilling at his brain. Sokka closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he was lying on the lush green grass, close to the pond and sleeping next to Katara. Getting up, he stretched and opened the notifications. Your wisdom has increased by one for tricking ancient spirits due to finding a loophole in the spirit hall. Where you're supposed to contemplate on your being, intelligence increased by one spear mastery has experienced a rapid increase in level spear mastery. Level 55 2, level 60 looking towards the pond, he smiled when he saw the moon and ocean spirits circling each other like always. Now, I know for sure that you can hear me even this way. Since our negotiations initially went wrong, let's admit that we are both equal. He dipped his hand in the water and could feel the warmth engulfing his palm. The water also felt heavy, like mucus. Suddenly the eyes of the ocean spirit shone, and the water started turning bright. It was at that moment Katara woke up. Huh? How did I fall asleep? Looking towards the pond, she saw a bright light coming out of it, and Sokka's figure stood amongst it. Plop. Suddenly he sank into the pond that wasn't any deeper than up to the knee. Katara hurriedly went towards the pond and saw her brother at the bottom of the pond. There the two fish swam in circles around his face. Sokka's eyes were shining in dark blue light, and it reminded Katara of Arn when he was in his avatar state. Katara, stay back, Sokka said, his voice sounding clear even though he was underwater. Also, it seemed like many people were speaking at the same time when he spoke. See you in a bit. Suddenly his figure seemed to dissipate, and so did the two fish. The light around the pond dissipated, and it returned to what it was before, as if all that had happened was just a hallucination. What the hell was that? Wondered Katara, unable to comprehend what had just happened. But she was sure of one thing. Her brother had somehow planned all of this, and didn't seem to be in danger. When he comes back, I can no longer just ignore what has been happening, she said with a resolute gaze. It had been quite a while now since Katara suspected something, and she needed Sokka to answer her questions. Azala stood on the heck of her ship, clutching at her bandaged stomach, but she stood tall, unwavering, showing the confidence that a royal should have. Tai Li and Mai stood next to her, ready to support their friend. I think Kuzan will be okay, Azala, Tai Li tried to reassure her friend, but Mai shook her head, signaling the circus girl to stop talking. The last thing Azala needed right now was to worry about Kuzan's well-being. Tonight we will dash as Azula started talking, but was interrupted as the ship started shaking. The whole ocean around them started shining in bright light. What's going on? Her question was answered soon, as something she couldn't predict even in her wildest dreams happened. God, what does he look like? Anyone who believes in a divine, or higher existence, has wondered what it looks like during a part of their life. Whether such a being existed or not was a whole other debate. But if it did, its form would be something incomprehensible to humans. That was how Azula felt, as she saw a giant figure, bigger than any mountain come out of the ocean. The sky seemed to darken at the divine looking creature's body. It was magnificent, godly. There was no other way to describe such a thing. It was at that moment when Azula understood that she had lost. Her strategies, plans and schemes 
no longer mattered in front of such absolute power. She stumbled and fell on the ground, using her hands to position herself to sit on the cold metallic floor. This has to be some kind of bad joke, she muttered. The fear is very apparent by now. Azala no longer saw a reason to act tough, because no matter what she did, or how she acted, there was nothing that could be done against such a creature. Is this how I die? Even the usually cold and emotionless Mai's eyes were widened with clear terror in them. Her body kept shaking, no matter how hard she tried to stop it. Tai Li was the only one who seemed to be even remotely calm. But that was only because she felt the divine looking monster's aura didn't show any sign of hostility. It seemed like there was no intent to harm them. But still, Tai Li knew by now trusting her senses wasn't a good idea. Especially when trying to read such a monstrous being. Shdash hey Azala, I wanted to tell tell you something. A stuttering Tai Li gathered her courage to speak. I like Kuzan well. I don't know if I really, really like him, but he is kind of the only choice I have. Any other guy and I will be able to tell what they're feeling. So it's kinda hard to get into a relationship like that. Also, I like how smart he is, and always seems to find something to talk about Dash. Now isn't the time. Mai yelled, stopping Tai Li in her mindless rant. Azala, wake up. We need to get out of here. Give your orders. The fire princess finally came to her senses and got up. Thank you for waking me up, she muttered. The fear in her eyes from before was gone in a split second. Azala's confidence was back in full force, and she started the gigantic creature straight in the eye, fearlessly. Fear won't get us out of this situation, so why bother with it? Everyone. She called out to her terrified soldiers, whose hearts were sunk to the brink of despair. Get this ship out of here. Turn the engines back in reverse. Break them if you have to. The captain, a white-haired man whose experience showed through the many wrinkles on his face and scars on his hands. Even someone like him was afraid. They were only human after all. Be dash but princess, what if we anger the deity? His meek talk annoyed Azala, and lightning crackled on her fingers. Then would you rather take your chances with the spirit being angry and killing? Or me killing you right now? The veteran gulped in fear and scattered off. I will tell everyone your orders, princess. Azala almost breathed a sigh of relief, since the ones inside the ship couldn't have caught sight of the visage yet, they were oblivious to what was going outside. So she planned to use them to turn back the ship in reverse. But now she had another problem in her hands, and that was the soldiers on deck. Their spirits were destroyed, and Azala didn't have some magic skill that could help them. Hey, you bastards, get up and fight. I don't care if you don't believe in yourself, all I need you to do is trust in me. Mai and Tai Li looked at their friend strangely, as if she had grown a second there. Since when had Azala been so forthcoming when telling people to do something? Is Azala changing? The two girls wondered. Trust in me to kill you all in the most painful way I can think of if you don't listen. Azala continued. Ah, no she hasn't changed at all. Mai and Tai Li had the same thought. The dull looks on their faces told it all. Still, Azala's threats were effective as the people's fear of her took root, and they started moving. That was when the gigantic creature swung its watery arm. At first it didn't hit anything, and everyone thought that maybe it wasn't that smart. But those thoughts subsided as their ships started tilting backward, as if the water under them was draining. They were right, as the water seemed to gather into a gigantic wave, that would sink islands and crush mountains. But when it hit, the wave was slower than something its side would suggest. While it tilted the ship, it didn't break or destroy any of them. Azala immediately caught on to what was happening. She narrowed her eyes as her body was racked with pain, feeling her wounds open as blood dripped from the corner of her mouth. That doesn't want to hurt us. Her breathing got heavier as her legs became noodles, wobbling, she fell to her knees. Clutching her wound, her vision started getting hazy. Go back Fire Nation Kuzan, take him back don't forget. Those were the last words she could mutter as her body plummeted towards the deck, though before it hit the ground Tai Li was there to catch her. There, I got you. She picked up Azala and a princess carry and brought her inside. Mai saw this and immediately took command of the ship. Azala had pushed herself too hard, standing up and commanding people even though she was injured not even a full day ago. Ash Sokka POV standing atop the world and looking down at the Fire Nation ships that seemed like bugs was quite exhilarating. Even though there was water all around me, I could breathe perfectly fine. The ocean spirit has attempted possession game as mine stop possession. The ocean spirit has attempted 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 possession. The gamer's mind has rebuked all possession attempts. Yeah. That little fish bastard was attempting to possess me. Sadly for him, it wasn't working. Well, if I could turn off Gamer's mind, I would have let him in. Maybe I could have sealed him by using my luck. That would have been a good way to get avatar level powers. Sadly, passive skills can't be turned off. Every move I have made until now has been carefully planned. There might have been a couple of hiccups here and there. But I wasn't some god who could make perfect plans and predict everything. But even with all of this, there is one big threat hanging overhead. Has the world ever given something to someone for free? The answer was no. So was the gamer interface any different? I don't know. Was it created by someone? I have no proof of that either. But ever since the beginning I have had this burning suspicion. The main reason I put so many points into luck was because of this. My suspicion only rose as I killed more and more higher level monsters. Wasn't my level rising a little too slowly? 
That was when it first hit me. If I was a gamer system creator, how would I make sure that the ones who got access to something like the gamer wouldn't go above me? Limiting the X or lowering the intake to 30%? No, that wasn't the right answer. But how about I take more than 50% of the experience points he gets when killing something or completing a quest? Now no matter what, he won't be able to grow stronger than me. At least that's how I would do things in that position. So no matter what I do, there is at least a 60% or more experience points that's taken from me with each thing I kill. It would be safer to assume that the experience point stealing was around 80%. Yes, someone who created gamer interfaces wasn't doing so for giggles. No, he had something to gain from them, and that was the experience points. Were there other gamers like me too? From what I have seen so far, there were none in this world. But due to the multidimensional chat, there is proof of other worlds out there. Fuck, I couldn't help myself from swearing. If it came to a fight against other gamers, who would win? A smart guy, a strong guy, or an extremely lucky guy? I wasn't going to be someone else's experience points mule. Even if he was stronger than me, no matter what I did, there's no way someone can stand above me. I was just too selfish, greedy, and self-serving to let something like that happen. Those thoughts passed through my mind like flowing water, and within a split second, I was free again. As the spiritual power faded out of my body, giving away to the high given by the moon and ocean spirit. Well, these were all theories I had, and none of them might be true. There was no definite proof of some other being that created the gamer interface existing out there. But it was better to be cautious about it than get caught by surprise. Suddenly, a very painful sensation hit my body as I felt the ocean spirit's energy rampaging in anger before it dissipated. You have acquired debuff. Crippled all physical stats minus 50% are. So they knew by now that this wasn't a relationship of equals, unlike what I had told them before. An equal relationship with a couple of fish. Nah, there's no way I'm doing that. Either you're under me, or dead. Well, under me, as in the leadership ladder. Not in a sexual manner. Probably still, this crippled debuff will be a little annoying until I go to sleep. A good night's rest would get rid of it. Sensation fades away as a white light engulfs my senses. The next time I open my eyes, I'm back at the pond with the moon and ocean spirit circling above my face. Getting up, I push them aside, and I felt the ocean spirit use his fishtail to slap me in the leg. Did he think I was done using him and the moon spirit? Yeah, keep dreaming buddy. I just got two weak fish that have superpowers. There's no way I am not abusing that. Of course, we will be equals in this relationship at least that's what I will tell you. Even if they aren't, the words will be enough to console him. It's not like he can do anything about it. Well, he technically can, but at the same time, I can technically go and cut up some fish too. So he should know better than to mess around by now. As I stepped out of the pond, water filled my lungs. With Gamer's body, I didn't have that terrifying drowning feeling on me. So it was easier to get the pond water out of my body. Soccer, who are you? Katara's voice brought me out of my thoughts. Looking at her I saw the uncertain gaze in her eyes. Well, it seems like the time has come. I knew this situation would eventually come. Whether sooner or later didn't matter. But now the question was how to deal with something like this. There were many ways. If I try to, I might even be able to change the conversation into something else. And make the situation seem less important than it seems. But no, it was time I dealt with this situation in a manner befitting its importance. Dodging the situation for too long could be bad. Well, I am still your brother if you're wondering about that. Since this was something I had expected to happen for quite a while now, I wasn't going to stutter or say something stupid. Right now, I need to be more forthcoming. Just as she was about to speak, I interrupted her. Do you know how many times we have come close to death? Back when you were sick, the time Zhao attacked us, both in the temple and his armada of ships trying to shoot us down. That has nothing to do with what we are talking about. It feels like I don't even know you anymore, as if you're a whole different person. I let her talk, and didn't interrupt her. This way she could get out whatever she had to say. But it does matter. We have been in dangerous situations multiple times. I clarified, maybe due to her age, she might have forgotten certain things. So I will remind her, you could have died, and so could I. That's why the change was inevitable, being a foolish sarcastic brother is okay during certain times. But this is no longer a situation where I can act foolish, and go penguin riding with you. You never went penguin riding with me. Well, it's a childish game. Why would I? Well, better think my words carefully before saying them. Having Sokka's memories at this point would have helped massively. But still, this is a death battle. What we are doing here isn't a stroll in the park. If I hadn't changed and adapted, we would be dead by now. Well, at least I and you would be. Arn has his whole avatar state thing going for him. She looked down at the green grass. I could see the gears turning in her head as many thoughts passed through her mind. Arn, Katara, and the original Sokka would have survived if I didn't exist or change either. But she didn't know that, and with how the situation has turned out, it's logical for her to assume that Un's journey would have been cut very short if I hadn't been there. Katara doesn't know what I do. My plans are many, little sister. I turned around and started walking away. Remember, people always change. Just like that, I walked off and looked at my new level ups and skills. Waterbending level 18 to 24 this one was quite good. Due to the ocean and moon spirit energy being imbued into me for a while, 
I got quite some benefits from it. Even a special title, which was essentially useless, but good when training waterbending. Blessed by the moon and ocean spirits, it also lets me heal faster when in water. I don't think they're meant to do anything like a blessing, but their energy did technically empower me. So they somewhat did lend me their power. The original plan was to trap them inside my body. Not only would they have been safe in there, but I would have gotten at a level waterbending. That plan is no more, due to the way things are playing out now. You can't predict people's reactions, especially the moon and ocean spirits, as I knew next to nothing about them. Once outside of the cave that led to the spirit pond, I could feel the cold air hit my face. My clothes were still somewhat wet, so I should have gotten Katara to take care of that. But right now, she wasn't in the right state of mind to do so. It was better to leave her alone for now. Walking down the street, I saw people praying to the moon and ocean spirits while bowing down and then celebrating. What foolish behavior. If it wasn't for me, or the threat to their well-being, the spirits wouldn't have even moved. Humans in this world need to come to their own terms and take care of their problems. If they had done that from the beginning this whole Fire Nation mess wouldn't have happened. Well, it wasn't my job to fix their mind. Nor did I care to. Walking through one of the corners without drawing too much attention, I arrived in an abandoned alley and did some hand seals. I made a water clone. Zabuza has been strangely quiet in the multidimensional chat. By now I had hoped that he would at least say something. For now. I don't have the time to try and coerce him into talking more. There's probably a reason why he is quiet, and sooner or later, I will figure it out. But for now, I had to go and deal with Azala. My plans with her aren't done yet. Normally I would feel a tinge of guilt manipulating someone like that, but for now, there's none. Since this should stop Azala from going down the path she originally went. Azala POV. The burning pain in my stomach kept me awake all night long. By now the ships had set sail for the Fire Nation, and I hadn't gotten a proper wink of sleep during it all. Even the expensive sheets and mattress were of no help as it felt like my organs were being melted off. TCH, there you go, pushing yourself too much. I felt like Kuzan was next to me saying what he would normally say. My mind was a bit cloudy, and I hadn't slept much due to the pain. Or else if he was here, then someone would have notified me. Damn, am I feeling guilty for leaving him behind? Yes, I am. But staying behind in that situation would have ended up in my death and the army's destruction. Sorry Kuzan. Those wounds are bad probably will get infected if someone doesn't take care of them soon. The people in this ship are too busy bouncing around to notice that their princess is slowly dying. Do they even know what an infection is? Suddenly, a comfortable, but cold water-like substance, touched my wounds as the bandages were slowly and gently taken off. I slowly opened my eyes and was greeted by the dim light of the candles in my room. Sweat rolled down my face as I saw something that shouldn't have been anything more than a dream. Kuzan's face scrunched in concentration as he manipulated water that shined a little and infused in my wound. The heavy injury was closing up quite fast. Ah, so he was a waterbender. That's a shame suddenly his gaze turned towards me, and I saw his eyes widen in surprise. Undoubtedly because he had been found out. His water splashed on the ground as it went out of control. Ah, could you forget that you saw that, he said while awkwardly smiling at me. No, I muttered barely able to speak. Shit, I shouldn't have said that. Instead lying would have been better. That way he might have at least let me live. My mind was too tired to think straight. Is this how I die? I asked him. Someone like Kuzan probably was skilled enough to make it look like I died of sickness. So this question of mine was quite stupid. He sighed, raising the water again. This is it here, I will die, in a dark room with no one to look over me. At least I won't have to face father's anger for failing this mission, so that's a plus. So, will my death be painful? He nonchalantly stared at me. I always hated how he never seemed to be worried about anything, as if he knew the future and was willing to accept losing. So, will my death be painful? Inquired Azala, as her heavy breathing of panic seemed to slow down. Why would I kill her? Sure, she saw my waterbending, but I wasn't the kind of guy careless enough to be caught with his pants down. I have seen enough and I'm, read enough manga, and watched a lot of movies to know just how cliche that would be. It a small part of the plan for Azala to catch me with my pants down metaphorically of course. Keeping a secret from her is dangerous. Because she's smart enough to figure shit out. Flickering her on the forehead and making the psycho chick flinch a little in surprise. I went back to work, healing her injuries. Using some of the water I had stole Dashkov borrow from the pond of the moon and ocean spirits. Seeing her breathe heavily, dark hair sticking to her too to her glistering skin due to sweat. Azala, if only you weren't a psycho, answer my question at least. How will my death be? She asked again, this time her thoughts seemed to be a little clearer. Her wounds closed themselves, and I kept working on healing the injury which was my fault. I won't kill you. I muttered with the most trying to speak as reassuringly as possible. Though you might decide to do the opposite to me after the healing is done. Heh, she snorted. Back to her shenanigans already. Of course, I will. Did you think I would just forgive you for lying to me for so long? I guess that's how it is. Without saying more I continued healing her. Her wound was already closed up. But there were some infected parts. By the way, 
Can I at least get good treatment in prison? I still healed you. No, she smiled in relief as her injury closed up. There wasn't even a scar left behind. You're going to the worst prison. Sitting up in the bed, she kept looking at where the wound used to be even while threatening me. She then glanced back at me, a small smile on her face. You're never leaving my side again. She was probably joking right? Because that coming from Azula could mean many things. Being a waterbender saved me in the Northern Water Tribe. Since non-benders got lined up, apparently there was a spy amongst them. Though they didn't find anyone, I tried changing the conversation. Azula winced at my words and admitted, that was my fault. It wasn't because such a thing didn't happen. What now? Are you going to attack again? Azula sighed. No, that would be suicide. It spared us the first time. Testing that again would be stupid. She looked regretful at that and clenched her hand into a fist. Azula was angry, but holding it in. I tried to think of something to say that would help her, but wasn't able to come up with anything. While I did lie to other people, it wasn't good to lie to myself. That was why I always made sure to tell myself the truth. What will happen from now on will be my doing. Your father will be enraged at this. You might even lose the air position. Heh, she chuckled as if having heard the funniest thing in the world. And make Zuzu the air instead. No, this was more than just that. A militarized failure of this caliber isn't something that can just be swept under the rug. Even if someone had somewhat total dictatorship power. Which the Fire Nation didn't as it had nobles that were powerful too. You'll probably be used as a pawn. I warned her. Azula from now on would start a destructive path. And I wasn't a bad enough guy to leave her to walk this path alone. Though I am sure you already predicted that. I know Azula quite well by now. And her genius was something that even I couldn't match with my gamer interface. If it wasn't for my future knowledge. I don't believe outplaying her would have been possible. Getting up. I sighed. The dim room made Azula's yellow eyes more prominent. She was looking at me. And I could somewhat tell that behind the calm demeanor. The Fire Nation princess was panicked. She knew what was going to likely happen. But had decided to ignore this. It would be something that gives her closure. Snap back to reality, Azula. You know how this will end. I warned her. Don't act as if you know everything. She suddenly yelled, her scream bouncing through the room. For a second I was worried she might burn off my face. But then remembered that this girl hadn't killed me yet for lying to her about being a waterbender. Father Will. I could see the doubt in her eyes as she spoke the next words. Give me a second chance. Will he? I wanted to ask that but decided not to. From now on, Azula had to come and make her own choices or continue living in a lie. As someone unloved. I can understand where she was coming from. Though it wasn't my parents that didn't love me. So we were in quite different situations. Once again, I couldn't help but sigh. Knowing how hard it would be for anyone to accept that the only person they thought might love them actually didn't. Dude, do you think he will cast me out? She suddenly asked, unsure if she wanted to hear an answer she already knew. Will I have no one else in this world? Damn, you want me to answer that? If I lie, you know I am lying and will be angry at me. If I tell the truth, you'll be annoyed that I said the truth. Thankfully, Azula seemed to have realized what she had just said and chuckled. You know if this situation ends up turning over. Will you leave me too? The desperation in her voice was clear. And I wondered if saying something like no I will never leave you is enough in this situation. Azula was smart, and sooner or later she would see through my lies. Since she wasn't stupid or gullible, she would be able to see them quite soon. By quite soon... I mean immediately after she calms down. If I leave you, then will you hunt me down? My question made her chuckle a little as the mood around us became softer. Obviously, she answered, her intense yellow eyes fixed on mine. If you run away, I will hunt you down and put a chain around your neck. I knew you were sadistic. I said in an overly dramatic manner, hugging myself in fake comfort. This was in an effort to get her mind off things for a little while. This whole thing is just an excuse for you to fulfill the evil and twisted desires you have for me. Ha 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 Azula chuckled in a mock villainous manner. You have finally discovered my master plan. We both laughed at the situation and Azula finally calmed down. Her worries seemed to flow away. But that nervousness was still there. There wasn't a magical thing that I could say which would make her not worry about this. Suddenly the door slammed open with a roaring crash. Tai Lee, my, and a dozen Fire Nation soldiers ready to fry me alive. But one Tai Lee saw me, she frowned. Right, she could sense my aura, and that could be troublesome. She was one of the only people in the world who would be able to tell who I was under any disguise. Mai, on the other hand, narrowed her eyes suspiciously when she saw Azala all healed up. Kuzan, do you think that you can just enter a royal family member's room so casually? This kind of crime is usually punished by death. Mai made it clear that she wasn't going to be on my side if something like that happened. Well, that was understandable. If I was in the same position as her, then I would do the same. That decision is for the princess to make. I glanced at Azala. My dear Dear Fire Princess's eyes turned cold when she saw me address her. Yes, put him in prison. That should teach him some manners. Oh, this was a little surprising. Even Mai and Tai Lee seemed shocked by it. What was Azula aiming at here? I couldn't tell. Has she figured out my ploy? Ash, Azula POV. What was I doing? I had no idea. But knowing what would happen if I went back home, it was time for a change of scenery. Looking at Kuzan's calm face as he was dragged away by the guards.
I made sure to keep my demeanor as calm as always. That guy could read people as if they were open books. Still, seeing how calm he always is was kind of irritating. Everyone leave, except Ty Lee and Mai. I muttered, making sure to keep my tone icy cold. Though even then, I noticed that people were no longer as scared of me as they used to be. As expected, the situation was only getting worse. Kuzan was right, there was nothing left for me. Chasing after empty bubbles now was useless. I peered into Ty Lee's innocent eyes and Mai's emotionless ones. How many people in this world cared about me? I would be happy if there was even one. Now that I could fight back if anything happened, I needed to ask my friends if they were really my friends. I am planning to run away. My statement shocked Mai, which was expected. She knew what was implied here, and I wanted her to run away with me. Her family would face some problems when that happened, so her choice was more difficult than Ty Lee's, whose family wouldn't be influenced that much, and they hadn't had that contact with her either way. But Mai was a different deal. I won't take you forcefully, but when I run off somewhere I don't want you to tell anyone where I might go, or fight against me. Well, Mai could try fighting against me, but it wouldn't go that well for her. I had taught both of my friends that lesson when we were young. I surprisingly, the one who seemed hesitant was Ty Lee. Sorry, but if news got out, then my circus crew would be imprisoned, just for having a relationship with me. Mai nodded too. Sorry, Azala, but something like that could spell doom for my family. Especially since my father is someone easily replaceable to the Fire Lord. Well, seems like no one was with me after all. Even Ty Lee was hesitant to join. This will be harder than expected. It made me feel a little nervous. Do you need some help? Suddenly Kuzan's voice interrupted my contemplation and surprised the two, as he was supposed to be in prison. His dark clothes, perfect for hiding in the shadows, riddles as he walked into the room, closing the door behind him. There was no sign of struggle, so he had probably taken out the guards before they could even react. What? He asked, noticing the icy gaze I was sending him. You would have broken me out anyway, right? He was right. Damn, Kuzan was too perceptive sometimes. In such a short time, he had probably figured out my plans by now. Um, how am I supposed to act now? The flamey glow in his eyes showed that he was amused by the situation, and I don't know why, but his expression made my heart beat faster. I wanted to tie Kuzan up and have him dress in a servant's outfit. He would look good in it, especially with his midsection exposed. No, wait, I need to think clearer. Can't let myself be distracted by such devious thoughts. No, I lied to him. I wasn't planning on letting you free. The journey would have been easier if you weren't around. Oh god, I am saying stupid things without meaning them. Hopefully, he doesn't take that the bad way. Should I tell him that was a joke? No, no, he would see me as weak if I said something like that. Can't have him learn more of my weaknesses. Well, seems like I will have to continue bothering you for the rest of the journey. Kuzen's smile slipped off his face a little, even though he sounded as if he didn't mind what I said. No, 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 no. I hope he didn't take that the wrong way. The anxiousness grasping at my heart made me stop logically doing things. Maybe he would like girls like Ty Lee more. Her breasts are bigger, and also she was easier to speak with. I knew how difficult it was for people to interact with me casually. I, I wanted to say something good about him. How much I appreciated him for healing me, and taking the risk of revealing his bending, knowing that would lead to a dangerous situation. All just for me. I am so thankful, so please hear me. You're not that much of a bother. Does that sound too arrogant? I can't tell what he is thinking, but hopefully, he doesn't see it in a way that I am unappreciative of his efforts and everything he has done for me. Who do I feel like there is something I am in the dark about here? Also, how did you heal so fast, Azla? Mai inquired. It seemed like she was unable to hold in her curiosity and cautiousness anymore. Though Mai was my friend and I used to trust her quite a bit, by how she has been acting recently, I can't trust her that much dash oh. I am a waterbender and use my healing abilities to help her, Kuzan answered nonchalantly, without missing a beat. The way he said it seemed like he was walking about the weather, and not something that could get him imprisoned. What the hell is he thinking? I had to try my best and keep my expression neutral. Acting enraged, surprised, or showing any type of weak emotion, for now, wasn't something anyone should do. Also you guys can come with us too, Kuzan suggested, manipulating the water in a cup next to my bed and morphing it into the shape of a ship. After all, people get lost at sea all the time. Azalea isn't going to betray anyone or run away. Instead, her ship will fall into the storms and get lost. She and her friends will be missing. This way, Ozai won't be able to do anything to your families. Nor will he care to hurt them. I didn't think of that. Ships get lost in storms all the time and get destroyed. This way, I would also be able to still keep my royal power. If I decided to come back one day, and won't be declared a traitor like Zuzu. Focusing on Kuzan, I see him smiling widely with an innocent look on his face. Sometimes I forget, but this guy is smart, probably a better strategist than even me. His innocent acts and silly words make one underestimate him. 
You're smart, it's kinda scary how good you are. Even without ever meeting my father, you can correctly guess how he will react. Hearing my words, Kuzan peered at me with a smile on his face that kept widening and proudly puffed up his chest. Of course, I am a goddamn genius seen once in 10,000 years. Yes, those kinds of words always made people underestimate him. His bragging that he didn't seem to even believe himself. What a strange guy I know quite a lot about his childhood from back in the day when we met and played those games. But he is an enigma, something that I can't understand. What's going on behind that happy, cheerful smile? Kuzan, what's your goal? What do you gain from this? I thought that at first, you might be after authority. But now he was whispering something to Ty Lee. That made the girl chuckle when he heard me. Turning around, he gave me a thumbs up. My goal. I just want to reach a happy ending to my story. I will do everything to reach happiness. It doesn't matter how many people I had to step on to achieve that self-satisfaction. I will kill someone's parents today. But then feeling bad for the kid, I will raise them. I don't want the world to change me. Instead, if there's something I don't like in the world, then the world should change instead of me. Wow, Ty Lee exclaimed in surprise. You're the most self-centered person I have seen. You know that the world doesn't revolve around you, right? Though she said that jokingly, it was clear that Ty Lee meant those words. Kuzan didn't seem to take offense to that and instead laughed. Ha 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 ha, you're so right. I am the most self-centered person in the world. My selfishness knows no bounds. Ty Lee frowned at that. Oh, right, she had a crush on him. Kinda forgot that. Still, will she like him now? Anyway, Kuzan dismissed the looks he was getting. I will tell everyone here the plan and Ty Lee. My, you can decide for yourselves if you want to come with us. In an unnamed, small town in the Earth Kingdom, Zuko was on the side of a street, wearing dirty green clothes, with Iroh singing next to him. The Fire Nation's prince, or now ex-prince, wasn't happy with the desperate situation that was very humiliating. But the old general Iroh, didn't seem to mind. Suddenly a tall young man around Zuko's age walks by. He suddenly stops and looks at Zuko, which causes the firebender to look down, to hide his face from the other man's view. But the stranger seemed insistent and crashed down. Zuko sneakily pulled out a knife and was ready to attack, just in case. But Iroh intervened and grabbed his nephew's wrist, stopping him from doing anything reckless, while the old general smiled at the stranger. How can I help you, young man? Or do you have some change to spare for two old beggars? The stranger smiled and looked at Iroh. Old man, and the other guy. Follow me. I have some work for you. Iroh narrowed his eyes at that and was ready in case anything happened. But he kept a smile on his face and nodded. I am thankful that you were willing to hire people like us. Sure. But next time, if you want to be beggars, this place isn't the best, a stranger instructed them. There are too many poor children around and people would rather give money to them than a young man with a working body and an old man. Ahaha. Uh -huh. Thank you for the advice, the old general kept his friendly demeanor. Kind stranger, but I don't think I got your name. You can call me Kuzan, I am somewhat of a traveler, the man smiled, revealing his identity without missing a beat. Iroh's eyes turned sharp within an instant. I heard that Princess Azula's ship got overturned. What's her right-hand man doing all the way here? Shouldn't you be with your missing princess? Sokka shrugged. People call me her right-hand man. That's flattering. Rumors say that you're more than just her right-hand man, Zuko added. Though I don't think Azula would ever feel anything for you. Sorry to break your heart if you're in love with her. But that girl is colder than ice. Prince Zuko, please be mindful of your words, Iroh said as they entered an empty alley. Warning his nephew, signaling that the man guiding them wasn't that simple. Ha 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 ha. Sokka laughed out as if he had heard the funniest thing today. After a minute, he tried to hold on, but chuckles kept escaping his throat. Taking a deep breath, he was able to calm himself down. Don't worry too much about my relationship with Azula. We get along quite well. Ashsuko POV, what a suspicious guy. That was the atmosphere that radiated off Kuzan. There was something strange about him, and it was quite clear he was hiding a lot of things. Still, I kept taking deep and regular breaths, making sure that I was ready in case this ended up being a battle. Uncle's instructions about firebending coming from breathing had stuck with me. Don't worry, and think of me as an angel of love Kuzan whispered, just enough so they could hear him, as they arrived at a bar in the sketchy alley. It was covered by shadows so if anything happened here, no one would see it. The situation is getting a little bad on a side, so we might be able to cooperate. So Azula is alive. Suddenly uncle asked, the polite smile never leaving the old man's face. If she is, then it seems like you're working behind her back. Also, she was the reason we ended up like this. Azula just came and took my ship, no permission needed. I added, supporting my uncle. Whatever Azula was up to, it wasn't bound to be good for us. Also, Kuzan didn't seem like the kind of guy you would want to meet in a dark alley. His whole demeanor screamed that he was dangerous. But the suspicious guy only smiled at us and opened the door of a bar. Since we had come so long, I decided that there was no use not entering. Getting inside, I could smell the draft alcohol in the air even when no one seemed to be here. The clattering of our feet on the wooden floor was the only sound that rang out. Barely any light seemed to enter the place, and visibility was low. Okay, this might have been a terrible idea. With such low visibility, 
and not knowing how our enemy fights could end up being our grave. Uncle made a small fire in his hand and lit up the place. I followed along and did the same. Kuzan didn't seem to mind as he went behind the counter and took out a couple of bottles of what can be assumed to be alcohol. Do you like wine or some stronger alcohol? Kuzan asked, taking out three glasses and clattering them on the table. Tears okay, Uncle Iroh intervened and stopped him from pouring the alcohol. My old body can't handle liquor at this age, and Prince Zuko is too young to get such bad habits. Kuzan shrugged and took out a kettle of steaming tea from under the counter, as if he had already predicted this. Jasmine tea, right. Uncle nodded, the smile on his face not faltering for a second, even though Kuzan had mentioned Uncle's favorite tea, that only those to him knew. Wasn't Uncle gonna do something now? He just revealed that he had some spies close to us. They could have been our cooks or ingredient providers on the ship. Or what used to be our ship. Poisoning us would have been child's play. But why is he telling us this? Don't overthink it, said Kuzan, staring me in the eyes as if he could read my mind. He turned towards Uncle and the latter's smile seemed to be infectious, as it caused the sketchy guy to smile back too. Jasmine tea is my favorite too. Iroh chuckled. Is that so? Without any doubt he took a sip of the tea, not even checking if it was poisoned. You remind me of another young man. A very troubled young man, he is traveling with the Avatar. Oh, I knew who Uncle was talking about. That guy named Sokka was very dangerous, and there have been some rumors about him going around, saying that he was the one that thwarted the Fire Nation's plans. Hum, how could I remind you of someone like that? Kuzan inquired curiously, a look of amusement adorning his face. The smile that was there previously had grown wider too. You both have that feeling of someone who's lost, can't find their way home. Iroh said, glancing at the young man's hand, which had a cup of jasmine tea. But Kuzan seemed unbothered by the words, and offered the cup to me, pouring a third one for himself. A home doesn't necessarily mean a place with four walls and a bed. A home is a place that protects you from storms. Uncle looked sad for a second, glancing at his cup of hot tea. All kinds of storms. Loneliness adds beauty to life. It puts a special burn on the sunset. That makes the night air smell better. Kuzan drank the hot tea in one fellow gulp, not even minding its heat. Being alone is good, Iroh refuted, but being lonely is the worst. What the hell were they talking about? I could tell that they were talking about something I had no idea about. I tried to decipher what their words meant, but the sudden creak of the entrance door interrupted my thoughts. Someone unexpected came in. What took you so long? Kuzan chuckled. Having an old man pick you apart isn't what I would call a good time. Mai comes in. Her moves graceful as always, the baggy clothes she was wearing hiding many projectile weapons. Zuko looked like a kid who saw his crush coming out of the TV. Her eyes though didn't meet her childhood crush, but instead, Mai sent a glare at me. Oh, seems like she finally noticed something. Well, by now it shouldn't matter. Also, girl, stop looking at me like that, or it will send your easily agitated boyfriend the wrong message. The dark room, with barely any light, made Mai appear quite sinister, like a ghost out of a horror movie. Her pale skin didn't help either. Zuko, her gaze turned towards her long-awaited. Okay, maybe I was exaggerating her feelings, since she seemed as emotionally inept as always. But she should be feeling happy, right? Mai, Zuko muttered awkwardly. I, I, oh, is he gonna confess? This is unexpected. How will Mai respond? God, I love the drama in the atmosphere as Zuko and Mai gazed into each other's eyes. A thousand words were said between them before they even spoke. Mai, long time no see. The Fire Prince ended his greeting lamely. I for sure thought he would confess. You know, when the emotions could have gotten the best of him after not seeing each other for so long. Mai took notice of my gaze and stared at me, frowning. Can you stop that? That was when I noticed the huge smile on my face. That clearly showed how amused I was by the situation. Sorry about that. Please continue getting lost in each other's eyes. Somehow me saying the obvious seemed to ruin the mood as my side and sat down at the bar table. Her scorching gaze seemed to want to bear a hole in my head. But I tried not to show any discomfort and kept my friendly smile. Maybe I should create some more drama and hint at my being in another relationship. I would have the front row seat to that chaotic fun. After all, even if she denied it, there would always be that sense of doubt on the back of Zuko's mind. Clang suddenly the sound of a cup hitting the hardwood bar table rang out. It came from Iroh, and the old man grabbed my attention. You have quite the twisted sense of amusement. Oh, it seems like he saw through my intentions. Hey, come on now. I wasn't going to do anything, old man. Iroh narrowed his eyes, and so did Mai. But there was no proof of misconduct here. Zuko, on the other hand, was like a headless chicken, acting like he understood what was going on. Sometimes being the stupidest guy in the room can be quite a blessing. I was at that place too. Everyone during their life was the stupidest person in the room at least once. The key was recognizing that and moving on. Also, it isn't like Mai and Zuko's relationship will last. Like most relationships at this age, people will change and move on. I mean drama only strengthens the relationship, right? Azala calls that expression trying to convince himself that he is going to do the right thing. Hopefully, you aren't thinking of doing something morally questionable. Mai had her eyes sharpen, and she ended up peering at me intently. Azala could read me better than most, so she sometimes knew when I was bullshitting something or someone. No, of course not. You're my friend and I would never do something hurtful to you just for some entertainment. That would be a sickening look on life. 
If Azula was here, she would see through it and know what I was thinking about. But Mai was different, she couldn't see through my mask. Judge someone not by their words, but by their actions. Most times your biggest enemies don't come bearing knives, but smiles. People say things they don't mean at least a thousand times a day. Words are but hot air breathed out. They have no value in determining someone's character or intentions. Mai wasn't at Azula's level yet, and seemed to trust my words. We were friends after all. In reality, I was friends with Azula, and that didn't necessarily translate to Tai Li and Mai. Of course, I won't ever say that out loud. But it was the reality of the situation. Anyway, the real reason we contacted you is more important than some squabble. I decided to get to the crux of the situation. Prince Zuko, I request you drop out of the succession of the Fire Nation throne. Mai was the first to frown, not having heard of this before. She had come here to smoothen things out for an Azula and Zuko collaboration. But Azula and I had made plans in secret. There will be no co-rulership, only an Azula-centered rule. Zuko could either follow along or be eliminated. I didn't want to kill Zuko though, as it was too troublesome. If I kill him, then I will have to kill Mai. And Iroh too. Killing the old man would also make me an enemy of the White Lotus. All of which were powerful and influential people in the Four Nations, essentially making me an enemy of the whole world in one fellow swoop. Even killing him secretly was a problem, as there were probably some pesky spirits observing me even right now. They probably are just waiting for me to make a mistake or do something they can use. Mai kept quiet, even though the deal I mentioned wasn't the one we had previously agreed on. What? Zuko yelled angrily, banging his fists on the table, and making the furniture almost catch fire. You think I will just turn over and accept such boisterous terms? No, but you can be coerced into it. This will probably take a while, and there was a chance that it wouldn't work. But Zuko had to skedaddle out of the succession line, or Azula would burn him alive. And while I didn't want to fight the troublesome White Lotus, she won't mind. I will even be by her side and help her identify the White Lotus members. But honestly, I didn't want Zuko to die either. Or else, Azula will just turn into another sibling killer that forcefully took over. There would be a lot of internal disputes if that happened. Since probably quite a lot of high-ranking people already hate Azula, she had learned a very rough ruling method from her father, and it was far from being perfect, or even that good. While it was better to be feared than loved, someone you love you'll betray easier than someone you fear. People can betray you for greed even if they love you, but if they fear you it's a whole different situation. History has proven that notion many times. Still, the balance was somewhere in between. Like a semi-strict parent, don't be too strict, but don't be too outgoing either. Kids don't know shit, so teach them what's right and wrong. If you let them do whatever they want then they'll become annoying brats. That was essentially the same with a leader and his people too. Give the illusion of freedom, but not the real thing. Real freedom is anarchy, and no one wants that. Turning towards Iro, I try to show a sincere look on my face. Hey, you know how Azula is. If he gets in her way, I swipe towards my neck in a cutting motion. She'll kill him. She can try. Zuko was enraged, and it was clear he would fight Azula if she was here. If anything else, he was a man of his word. I will fight her any day. Mai looked on uncomfortably, knowing just how dangerous our dear blue-fired friend could be. If Azula doesn't go insane, she can beat Zuko 9.5 slash 10 times. Also if she decided to kill him, she won't do so herself and will have someone, probably me, assassinate him. Now, now, Prince Zuko, there's no need to be angry. I tried to ease the situation. Could you imagine the work I will have to do if the situation delves into a violent one? I am a true pacifist at heart somewhat, not really. But it's the thought of peace that matters. Azula doesn't want to fight with her brother either. I doubt that Zuko snorted. Yeah, you're right to doubt it. Because if everything was left to her, then you would be toast by now. Think about it, Mai intervened emotionlessly. Do you even want to rule the Fire Nation? Or is it that you just don't want Azula to rule? So how about you discover what you want Dash? You just don't want me to rule, is that it? Zuko got angry and got up about to storm off. Oh well teen drama. Thank god he went outside. Or I would have to physically try and zone out that stuff. Mai chased after an angry Zuko and both walked out. This left me alone with Iro, the uncle everyone wishes to have. He was looking at me, and then the door, seemingly contemplating if he should go after his nephew. In the end, he just shrugged and stood here, taking another sip of his tea. Good tea, you've got some talent. That's a good compliment, coming from the best tea maker alive. Thanks, I tried to make it to your tastes. He nodded, and a flame-like passion appeared in his eyes. Have you ever thought about improving upon this talent? I could help you learn. Learning tea making from Iro? That sounded amazing actually. It's not like I had anything better to do. And for me, tea also works as a stat booster potion. Zuko stormed outside angrily, clenching his fist with wrath burning on his eyes. He had to physically try and not use firebending. Since they were still in the Earth Kingdom, anyone caught firebending here was likely to be executed. Zuko, stop, Mai's words made him halt for a second. But he continued walking. Even if no one believes in me or my abilities, I will prove them all wrong and become the Fire Lord. Getting back my honor and reclaiming my rightful place. Fwish. 
Suddenly a sharp pain hit his cheek. It was a throwing knife, and it sunk into the wall so deep that only the hilt was left to be visible. It seemed that the thrower had been angry and used all of their power. Turning around, Zuko was met with Mai's scolding gaze. Don't be stupid, she warned him. While you might have had a chance if it was just Azula, there is no way you would be able to overcome someone like him. Oh, so your new lover has different goals in mind. And you're trying to stop me, Zuko remarked, snorting at Mai's words. She clenched her teeth and a gaze of anger burned deeply within her pupils. You're so stupid. Kuzan is a different breed of monster from Azula. She might imprison you for fun and to torment, but he will immediately finish you off. Her body shook as memories of some of the cold things he had done came to mind. So don't fight them. If there is any feeling of love you have for me, listen to me just this one time. Fighting them will be your doom. Zuko didn't know what to say in response. He wanted to fight for his honor and rightful place. But seeing Mai so distressed made him have second thoughts. Don't fight them, Mai insisted once again, her heavy breathing calming down, as her demeanor went back to normal. This is the last warning I can give you. This is all I can do for you. If I were to do anything and even hint them of betrayal them, Azula might just imprison me. But Kuzan he will go after my family, and little brother. Also, they hadn't done anything that earned Mai's betrayal and she knew that doing something rash now would only earn their wrath even more. What neither of them noticed was Azula entirely on top of one of the roofs. You see, Zuzu can be quite understanding once he gets the gist of the situation, Azula chuckled amusingly. Tai Li on the other hand pouted, but it's annoying how Kuzan predicted how this would go. Even though we didn't give any instructions to Maya and left her in the dark about the situation, Azula only had a content look on her face, and unlike her friend, she wasn't worried about how good Kuzan was at orchestrating situations like this. His strength is my strength, and my strengths are his too. Having someone so competent by my side isn't so bad. She blushed a little at the thought of Kuzan, but such thoughts were kicked away as soon as they came. Though Tai Li kept glancing at her friend suspiciously. So, do you like Kuzan? Azula's body clenched in surprise. The princess would have done a spit take if she was drinking something. But she smiled and soon got control of herself. I guess you could say so. After some talking, Zuko and Mai went back to the bar Iro and Kuzan were at, but as they entered, they looked around surprised. It felt like a different building. Are we in the right place? Asked Zuko, as the dark room from before had been well lit with many lamps. The place was orderly and clean, even a couple of customers were drinking some tea. Iro and Kuzan were laughing good heart as the former taught the latter about tea making. Unlike the tense atmosphere from before now, they seem to have grown to become friends. This is undoubtedly the same place, Mai confirmed frowning in confusion too. How long were we out there? Five minutes at most. Even Azula who was observing the situation from outside was bewildered. By using the map I could see Azula and Tai Li were observing too. That was a little worrying. There were certain things I didn't want her to see. But if I am careful then it should be okay. If I am going to fix this world, I will do it my way. The shop we were currently in had brightened up and the atmosphere. Seeing Mai and Zuko so surprised was entertaining. I had to make the angry teen calm down. While normally, Zuko would have been easier than Azula. That was if I hadn't read the comics after the main story. He had one difficulty after another. His rule was plagued by many problems, and most of them were because he wasn't decisive enough. Azula right now was perfect to take over, she could satisfy both the old forces that supported Ozai, and the newer peace-loving faction. Though there was a chance she could still go crazy, as long as something too drastic doesn't happen, she should grow to be an amazing leader. Ruthless and saintly, she would use whichever side was needed. So have you come to your decision? I inquired, acting as if I hadn't orchestrated this situation. If it was just me asking him this, the chances of Zuko listening to me were low. But if Mai was the one to talk to him, then he would probably listen. Predicting how someone would react was almost impossible. But trying to guide them towards a certain decision, they are more likely to choose then. I didn't have a lot of experience in this kind of manipulation. After all, I was just an average Joe you would see walking down the road. My hobbies were fairly average too. Everyone starts like that at one point. Even the worst people in history, whose names will be known throughout the world, start as failed art students. I don't want to give up the throne, Zuko hissed, and that surprised everyone in here, even me. Though Iroh only smiled as if already having come to terms with it. You think Azula will be better than me as a ruler? Then you don't know her at all. With that said he walked off again, this time with no intention of returning. Mai seemed conflicted for a bit, and I didn't know whether she might leave with him. But in the end, she looked at the ground reluctantly and stayed. You have some talent in making tea, Iroh on the other hand didn't seem worried about the situation. If you ever want to open a tea shop, we can do one together. With that said, he walked off after his nephew. That old man was something. He genuinely seemed more worried about tea than who the future ruler of the Fire Nation would be. I couldn't tell whether Iroh was messing around here. While Zuko went out, Azula came in 
and she had an excited smile on her face. Well, it seems like things aren't going with the plan anymore. We'll have to try and come up with another one to manipulate things to go my way. So you are observing us. She didn't need to answer that as I already knew the answer. And by the smirk on her face, she could tell that I knew. Why are you trying so hard to stop Zuzu? Even if he wanted to take my throne, he's quite incompetent. But he will grow into someone who will be your worst opponent, a kinder version of you. Someone who is a pushover. And not only will the population like someone like that more than Azula. But even the higher ups would like someone they can push around easier. Hell, even other nations would like to have a pushover as the leader of a dangerous nation that previously almost conquered the world. I had put too much effort into this to have it all crumble down like a castle of cards. It wouldn't be good to underestimate him, Azula. To everyone else, they would rather have him as the Fire Lord than you. No one likes competent people. She seemed, get closer to the bar table and put her hands down, leaning on them and smiling. I like competent people. Immediately I stared at Ty Lee. Did you teach her something weird? No, no. Ty Lee shook her hands and head in denial. Of course not. Azula pinched my arm, quite painfully, trying to get my attention. But due to Gamer's body that pain barely lasted a second before it became nothing more than a tingle. Hey, don't be so angry, the Fire Princess muttered, with a knowing gaze in her eyes. You're trying to make things work for my benefit, and if it doesn't work, I need to be angry. Not you. Sigh, damn it. She was right. But I had to go through quite a bit of trouble to orchestrate this whole thing. What most people saw was how I had a bar in a city where Zuko was present at a certain time. I had to use my map and waste Earth Kingdom money on something I wasn't planning to use anymore. Also, I had to buy this before they even came here and bought bars in another three close by towns. Yeah, while plans might look clean and good at the end of something, the effort put into them was enormous. I try not to have it bother me. The thought of someone giving me the gamer interface is terrifying. Especially as I slowly started releasing certain things, everything about the gamer interface was made to encourage the player to level up. For example, how each level gives a point in the gotcha, and how every 10 levels I get a new function. This only makes it more clear that someone was trying to create something which was addictive to level up. Like a casino making you win the couple first times, just so they can continuously dry you up later. It made the user feel special, when no one really was that special in the general gist of things. Keeping in mind that I wasn't special, that was good, since I doubt I am the only gamer out there. But that was a good thing, since the creator of the interface wouldn't be able to keep an eye on me constantly. Also, his control isn't absolute, or else I wouldn't have even had the chance to have such rebellious thoughts. Why give someone something when they wouldn't be the perfect mule? Staying in this world won't give me a choice on fighting against an existence like that. When I go against an existence like that, then I need to be prepared to not only kill them, but to lose this fight and die. It wasn't like I wanted to die, but living under someone else's thumb and their plan was something I despised. For now, I don't want to die. I haven't experienced anything in life, so I must live the kind of life I want, and after that, go and give it my all to destroy my creator. They have an advantage over me, an overwhelming one. But so what? Humanity didn't become the most dominating race on Earth due to being physically strong. Power has many variations to it, due to planning to fight against error, and have come up with a viable strategy. Your intelligence has increased by one for now. This was one of the least worrying things. I just have to hold my leveling up for now, as it would only send them experience points, and would make my enemy stronger. While becoming a hermit wasn't the answer, right now I need to prioritize increasing my stats naturally, leveling up skills. Clenching my hand, I could feel my heart beating in my chest. Fear crawled up my spine. I wasn't some fearless hero, but letting fear decide my actions wasn't something I would ever let happen. Azula, can I get a break for a couple of days? I asked the Fire Princess. In reality, I don't really care what her answer is. But this would make the mentally damaged girl think that she was in control of me. She needed to be in control of something with how things were going. Until those childhood wounds are healed, I will have to play at being someone who is firmly on her side, and won't leave her. I need some fresh air to come up with new plans. It's annoying having a plan you work so hard on and end up failing. Sure, she shrugged nonchalantly, but don't worry too much. No one is perfect. Was she trying to comfort me? Jeez, when did I become so readable? Why are you looking at me as if you can't believe your eyes? It's annoying. She frowned playfully. I chuckled. Called. Maybe you're better than I thought. What's that supposed to mean? She pouted childishly, something that the previous Azula would never do. I saw the hint of a blush on her face as she turned around. My, Ty Lee, let's go. After this break, meet us in Bar Sing Si. You'll know when we're there. Also, go and visit your sick sister sometimes. Sick sister? Oh, she's talking about that fake excuse I gave her once. Well, I did have something similar like this in mind back then, and plan to use my non-existent sick sister. Though it was somewhat a half-truth since I will be visiting my sister, and don't plan to meet with Azula for quite a while. 
Seeing her walk away, unconsciously dozens of plans formed in my mind. Right, it's about time I go and meet with Katara. I hope they aren't in a dangerous situation. Ding. Miss Demon has posted a new message in the multidimensional chat. I stared at the notification for a good 10 seconds. Something felt strange. He should have started talking long ago. Why now? This situation might have delved into something else completely. Mentally demanding the opening of the chat. I saw what was written. Miss Demon, I need some information. I will give you some jutsu in exchange for information. Okay. So this wasn't Zabuza. Too soft-spoken and giving to be him. I could already tell it was someone else. This could be a trick. But what would he get out of that? Nothing. So I doubt it's a trick. The Demon of the Mist might not have been the most business-savvy guy. But he was damn aggressive. I would have to work my ass off to be able and pull a jutsu out of him. He knew how valuable they're. Though he didn't know exactly how valuable they were to me. He somewhat had an idea of it. I quickly thought of something to write, and it appeared in the chat. B-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Sure. How about an exchange of 10 B-rank Jutsu and 2 A-rank? Or just 1 S-rank? Zabuza would have likely destroyed the scroll before letting it land on the opponent's hand. So this probably isn't someone like Kakashi. No, the most likely new owner of the scroll is Haku. While Zabuza was smart as a Jonin and couldn't be tricked that easily. He never explained the Jutsu rankings either, but he didn't know I already knew more about his world than he did. Of course, he couldn't have known something like this. So the information he gave to Haku is most likely flawed. This was something I could use. But first I will have to confirm that it's her, I mean him. Miss Demon, I do not have that many Jutsu to pass over. How about just 5B rank Jutsu? Hell yeah! This is way, way easier than I thought. During negotiation you must always show a high price that most people wouldn't be willing to pay. But for information, I would even accept a D-ranked Jutsu. Yes, I was willing to go that low. But she didn't know that. Zabuza wouldn't have been this easy to outmaneuver, but Haku was. Also Vali doesn't seem to be online, and we didn't have a good relationship, so I must finish this deal before he sees what's going on. What Haku likely wanted right now was information. Just by her short messages I could tell she was very desperate for information. While walking out of the bar and tried to think about how I could get the most out of this deal, Haku wasn't dumb either, and she dash. He would notice what was happening eventually, but I will milk this situation as much as I can until then. As I walked down the roads, happiness burst out of my heart, finally I could get stronger, especially since I was a little hesitant to level up. At least until I understand the situation better and find some loopholes, everything has a loophole somewhere, you just need to look for it. Seeing Ezela walking away, I contemplated saying one last thing to her, but decided against it for now. She didn't need to know some things for now. I walked the opposite direction, and my heart hardened, I needed to do this. Ambition without action is just a fantasy. I muttered under my breath as now it was time I took action directly instead of using subsidies. If any spirit gets in my way, I will destroy them. I kicked off the ground, and I could feel the earth below me crack in the shape of a spider web as my foot sank in the dirt. F bracket has been activated boom by using sense danger. I was able to dodge the buildings I would have slammed on, and things around me had become a little clearer than the last time I had used bullet time. The air I was breathing hit my lungs like a punch, due to the velocity I was moving at. But Gamer's body handled any discomforting pain that followed. Within an instant, I was in the middle of a lush forest, no one was around me, and I made sure of that by using the map. Instead, I also entered a meditative stance, while in the Northern Water Tribe, I had learned something from the ocean spirits. While it hadn't appeared as a skill yet, I could depart my soul from my body. Now this by itself wasn't that impressive, especially since it made me susceptible against spirits, and in this form I couldn't bend at all. Being in the spirit form was weird, as not only did I lose by gamer's body skill, but I couldn't feel anything at all, and the weightlessness was very weird too. Also the strange sense of calmness radiated through me, a feeling of serenity. But among my spirit form, there was a small, barely noticeable strand that connected me with someone. I moved my consciousness towards it, and within an instant my spirit was floating above a flying appa. I saw my water clone fake sleeping, and Katara was feeding Kiwi some strange fruits, and babying the fox spirit like she always was. Arn was holding the reins while standing atop appa's head. My water clone immediately opened his eyes and glanced towards me signaling that he could see my spirit firm. Well, that was a curious thing to know. But he wasn't the only one who noticed as Kiwi jumped in panic into Katara's arm when it saw me. What a little shit. I am your owner, not Katara. But I would let that slide since to me, the little fox was next to useless. Katara could make better use of the spirit, and it would protect her in a sticky situation. The reason this spirit ability is so good was due to how it allowed me to see a place, which completed the conditions needed for my teleporting boots, which were soon going to break. But I had found a good loophole at least. Fwosh. I went back to my body and closed my eyes, clicking my alligator skin boots, and the light around me dimmed, and it felt like I was sucked through a tight tube for a split second, and next thing I knew I was transported on top of Appa. With bullet time still activated, 
I ran so fast dismissing my clone and taking its place before anyone else should notice. Hum, what was that strong wind? Wondered Katara, looking around strangely. Not noticing the water puddle that the clone had left behind had become a blob of liquid above my palm. But since I was acting as if I was asleep and had my back turned, she couldn't see what I did. Kiwi looked at me weirdly, but one threatening look sent at the creature was enough to shut her up. Oh wow we are flying in the air and some wind hit us. That's surprising, sarcasm dripped out of my voice. Katara frowned. If you were awake you could have said so. So I need permission from you to be awake now. I asked trying to add fuel to the fire. You could have said something, Katara took the bait. Come on guys, don't fight. Arn, like the always peaceful monk, tried to mediate the fight between us. Of course, it wouldn't work. But at least he tried. I haven't had a fight with my sister in almost a week. And it feels like an eternity already. I am not fighting. It's just like her dictator royal highness likes for everyone to announce when they wake up. Katara frowned at my words and stopped playing with Kiwi and got ready for an argument that would last us until we reached our destination. At the same time I opened a multidimensional stat page with a mental command and wrote down E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64, 5B rank Jutsu, and 1A rank, I will give you any information about the chat that you want. In the future you won't pay any more for it. I made sure to word it in a way that would make it seem like a good deal for her. Like the shops that put items on offer. From $100 shoes to only $29.99. Of course people will buy them because they think they're saving money. Which they aren't. Miss Demon. Deal. She is a pushover. I am going to use her naivety before she smartens up. Seems like I finally got my slave labor dash I mean unpaid in turn. She could have gotten this information for free but didn't know anything about this chat room yet. This kind of makes me the scammer in this scenario. I should start chatting up Vali soon too. Two victims is always better than one. Ash Sokka's they got closer to Amashu. Appa had to rest after his long flight across the sea. Sokka took this chance to open his map and noticed that the base with General Fong wasn't too far away. A certain thought passed his mind, but he dismissed it just as quickly as it came. An army. He needed that bad. Sometimes you had to go to the lion's mouth to kill the beast. Or something like that. But Sokka wasn't trying to come up with a quote. Instead, he tried to recall how this episode played out. Since it had been over a decade since he saw the Avatar, his memories were a little foggy. Though the intelligence stat helped somewhat. So he wasn't going in blind. Still, being in this world for quite a while now had refreshed his memory. He knew how General Fong was. And how the old general would threaten Katara's life in the original story. This was due to the man's desperation to have Ung enter the Avatar state and defeat the Fire Nation that way. Sokka had already finished his deal with Haku and got the Jutsu's detailed descriptions in the chat. He would copy those later to create a skill book and he had also given the information Haku wanted. There should be an Earth Kingdom base that way. Sokka pointed towards a certain discretion. Arm stared towards the horizon but saw nothing, only mountains upon mountains. I don't see anything. That's because you don't have my super eagle. X-ray sight that can see through mountains. The air monk was confused tilting his head. He was over a hundred years old, so Sokka understood when sometimes sarcasm flew right past Arm's bald head. He just used a map Katara side. So don't listen to anything he has to say. Sokka smirked. Hey now little sis, don't ruin my fun. There aren't a lot of ways to entertain myself up here. So it's either starting an argument or being sarcastic. Or you could just stay quiet. And just like that another argument started. Sokka had an elated smile, his eyes filled with happiness, while Katara screamed in anger. He was reminded of the times Iroh said that he had quite a twisted sense of humor, and how he amused himself. Sokka couldn't help but agree. The old uncle was right, like always. Upon landing in the middle of an open space, which was a ground walking road, the avatar and his team were welcomed happily. Sokka and Katara stopped arguing too. When alone they might get on each other's nerves sometimes, but as siblings, they understood that publicly fighting would only make them seem divided. Avatar. Suddenly a yell of joy rang out as a man dressed in armor distinct from the other soldiers came running. He had a long brown beard, and his eyes glistened with hope. The brave warrior? Sokka, and the beautiful maiden, Katara. I welcome you to this humble camp. Though the man acted very honored, the place was anything but humble. Great walls stood about training dummies, and earthbenders littered the place. This was a fortress, and it wasn't something easily dismissed. Sokka could tell that this was the earthbender's home advantage. Hello, General Fong. Right. Sokka stepped forward, clasping his hands respectfully. I was wondering if we could rest here for the night. Our sky bison is tired, having carried us straight from the northern water tribe to here. Well, maybe not exactly straight as they had traveled by boat a little. As water clone Sokka had been around to make sure that the deal had gone well and supplies from the northern tribe were sent south. We would be on a two. General Fong smiled and laughed out loud at the proposition. He didn't bother hiding how happy he was at this. I have already prepared a feast for you. Can they afford to waste resources on a feast? Sokka wondered. Feasts wasted a lot of supplies and food that could be used in the war. But he could assume many ways General Fong could be playing it. Sokka had seen the beggars and starving children of the Earth Kingdom. A small feast won't blindside him to the reality. Each day they keep messing around, a starving person will die because of them, soldiers will kill each other. 
Blood will spill, and battlefields are going to be covered in corpses. Sokka knew what it was to have someone close to you die because of a stupid decision by the higher-ups. They make a single mistake and thousands die. Like a judge that can sentence an innocent man to death. When the time of the feast came about, Sokka observed as the festivities happen around. He gave one glance to Kiwi, and the small fox spirit that was hiding under Katara's clothes, gave a nod. I heard about the spirit that decimated the Fire Nation fleet. Can you tell me more about it? Inquired Fong, interested in the prospect of having a powerful spirit like that as a protector. Even Sokka was a little surprised, as by now Fong should have started trying to guilt Trip Ang into entering the Avid Estate. But instead, the man had taken a different approach. Sokka felt a sense of intrigue at this. At first, he had thought of having General Fong have an accident. It was a shame since the general was very passionate. But seeing this, a new plan started being concocted. So with a smile on his face, Sokka, who was sitting at the same table as the general, tried to get Fong's attention. I heard spirits can be quite peculiar. If you can get them too like you, they'll be your companion for the rest of their life. Immediately that caught the general's attention, and he turned towards Sokka so fast that many felt like his neck would break moving at those speeds. Oh, please go on. Fong had an intense gaze, and Sokka could feel the tension in the air, but he wasn't pressured by it. And he just continued. Normally spirits are kind of wild, and rarely come to the human world. But when they do, supernatural events follow with them. Some spirits are strong, and some are weaker. But humans and spirits can make deals and come to an understanding. He mentioned towards Kiwi secretly, and the little fox jumped up, creating small clouds in the air as it stepped on them. This gave Kiwi an ability that somewhat imitated flight. This was a small trick as the little fox spewed out some smoke, and these lame performances had everyone staring at it in amazement. Sokka on the other hand was very unimpressed by all this. But the trick had worked as intended. He knew that making his words believable for everyone there needed to be proof. This was also so he could draw everyone's attention that similar results could be achieved with Arn's avatar state. The avatar essentially is the perfect tool for this. It is the best combination between human and spirit suddenly. Sokka's thoughts halted as he glanced at Kiwi. An idea struck him like a bolt of lightning, and he now saw a solution he hadn't even thought of before. The fusion between human and spirit is possible. Rava had shown that with the first avatar, and that was how the cycle started. Kiwi was a weak spirit, just like Rava was during the fusion. But the nine-tailed spirit foxes, while they might not be at Rava's level, they too were known as strong, and a mature nine-tailed fox should be around the same level of old iron, a spirit that was somewhat equivalent to an avatar, around as strong as the ocean spirit. Was a fusion similar to that possible with Kiwi? Having such strength at his fingertips excited Sokka, making his heart beat faster as a sense of greed bubbled within him. But he crushed those feelings with an iron grip, faster than Gamer's mind could intervene. Being reckless now would be a stupid move. For all he knew, only spirits like Rava and Vata could achieve such results. Usually, humans and spirits fusing would cause the human to die, if the spirit stayed inside their body for too long. Even if they get out before the victim dies, they will usually be left with strange deformities. Sokka remembered these details from Korra when she learned of the first Avatar story. But that was also the reason he believed that fusion between a human and spirit would be possible. Even when the Avatar cycle started, Rava itself didn't believe that a human and spirit could achieve such perfect symbiosis. I will need to do some research on this later. Sokka put the idea on the back of his mind and planned to experiment with it later. Unlike others, he wasn't worried about any physical deformity, or anything he might get if this fails, because with Gamer's body, he only needs a full night of sleep and most effects will disappear. Still, for now he decided to keep such things for later on in life. Sokka didn't want to test just how effective Gamer's body and what its limit was. Now wasn't the best time to say the least. Kiwi kept performing its tricks, before suddenly jumping towards Katara and running into her arms shyly. Sokka smiled at the cute fluffy creature. Spirits love remarkable things. Sokka commented, his eyes closing as he smiled in a friendly manner. General Fong listened to his words carefully. The Northern Water Tribe likely had a general, or someone from a long time ago. So long that even books don't write about him. F bracket skill activated Sokka made sure to associate this non-existent legendary figure with General Fong. People always like to compare and see themselves as something great, special, and destined. Especially people in a world where destiny seems so prevalent. Honorable Sokka. Do you know what things should be done for a spirit to follow you? General Fong had fallen for a scheme like a fish in water. Katara gave her brother a strange look that said, You scamming people again. Sokka of course ignored such looks from his sister, and instead he played the role of a knowledgeable man, and nodded. The nod had a double meaning, both to the general's question, but also to her sister's thoughts that he could clearly read on her face. Yes, the only way to get a spirit to become your companion, you must become someone truly revered. Sokka had no idea what he was spewing out, but with the help of his acting skill, he seemed confident enough, and his words were logical to a certain degree. 
Also, he was the Avatar's friend and companion. People mostly assumed that he knew more than anyone else about the spirit world, since the Avatar was the bridge between worlds. Every day I feel the road of a scammer becoming easier to walk. Maybe instead of a gamer interface I should have gotten a scammer system. Sokka contemplated as he observed General Fong's smile widened as he looked at his hands clenching them. The ambition in the man's eyes seemed to burn brightly, like the sun. That was a little worrying. Of course, the orchestrator of this, Sokka, only smiled politely and drank a small dosage of alcohol. Katara tried to sneak in and try some liquor too, but he stopped that bad habit before it even started. He sent her a pointed look, which stopped his sister in her tracks, she pouted. So what? You're drinking too. Do as I say, not as I do. Sokka instructed her with a mock sage-like voice, a small smile making its way on his lips. That sounds like something a bad parent would say. Katara wasn't convinced at all by her brother's acts. Sokka shrugged, not refuting her. The reason he was drinking liquor was to give the illusion that he was more mature than he looked. Of course this wouldn't normally work that well but he made sure to bulk his body. The original Sokka had a twig-like thin body, but this one had some muscle. Sokka's strength was many times that of an average man, and his body showed that he was more muscular than the average person. Sokka still wasn't at the level of a bodybuilder, but he was in good shape. He left the general to come to his own assumptions, and didn't care where his mind went. Sokka wouldn't even mind it if General Fong decided to take over the Earth Kingdom in the future. Actually, he hoped the general would cause a little bit of a ruckus in the future. It would give him some smoke screen to move around. Sokka closed his eyes, imagining chess pieces in his head. The game is at a stalemate currently. But if life was like chess, things would be a lot more simpler. As the feast went along, Sokka filled the general's head with whatever the man wanted to hear, adding undertones of destiny into play, and how we must sometimes try and make our own destinies to fulfill a purpose in this world. Mostly bullshit he only half bellows and sounded right in the ear. The dim moon shone in the sky as Sokka stood in the balcony, Looking at the celestial bodies in the sky, it always made him feel so small when he understood just how big the universe was. Turning around from the view outside, he glanced at the luxurious room they had been given for today. Three good beds and fruits on a table. Arm was quick to fall asleep, but Katara wasn't. While she acted like she was asleep, Sokka could see that she wasn't. He wanted to train a little in secret like he did every night, but he couldn't do that while she was awake. So he went and sat down next to her bed. Is something worrying you? Katara sighed at her brother's voice, and Sokka saw her curl into herself even more. Do you think we can win this war? The desperation in her voice made it clear that she had been worried about this for a long time. With a sigh, Sokka got up, which made Katara glance curiously at him. In truth, even he didn't know if he could end the war. Well, he technically could by going and killing the Fire Lord. But would that end it? What did ending the war even mean? Also, could he kill the man? Someone who came from a dynasty who fought against Earthbenders that could dig underground. The likely place he could assassinate the Fire Lord would be in tight spaces. Not a lot to dodge from as fire would be blasted at him. A short-sighted idea like that wasn't something he had in mind for now. But it did pop its head whenever he was worried about something or the other. So many questions with no answer in sight. By now some colonies have been with the Fire Nation for over a hundred years, and essentially become one. Then should we leave them as that, giving the Fire Nation a clear opening in case of an invasion again? If this one is stopped, ending a war was such a complicated question that even the Avatar wouldn't be able to answer. Yes, in the end Sokka crushed his uncertainties too, and instead concentrated on the things he could control. We will win. Winning a war and ending it were very different issues. After all, even killing the Fire Lord if the vacuum left in power needs to be filled by someone worthy. Katara still seemed worried. So Sokka stopped planning for a minute, and all of his worries slipped away as he went and hugged his sister. Don't worry about it too much. You have me here, no matter how it ends, I will protect those close to me. I am quite selfish and like to be happy, without caring about others too much. You keep saying that, but in my eyes you're quite kind even in the Northern Water Tribe. You did all that just to save the lives of Fire Nation soldiers. Katara chuckled as she hugged him back. Though the time they didn't argue was little and far in between, as siblings they cared for the other. If one fell, the other would be there to catch them. That was a complicated situation, but I understand why she would see it that way. Sokka contemplated, gazing at the balcony one last time, and a small smoke came to his face. Not long after that, Katara fell asleep and Sokka went to train his spearmanship, knowing that soon there will be some big things. The next day's dawn came about quickly, and Sokka spent the whole night training on the roof. No one but Kiwi was there to keep him company. The little fox bathed in the cold night wind that Sokka's spear created. Kayu. She made some cute noises when the sun came up, and Sokka couldn't help but chuckle. The little fox rolled around like a cat. You cute bastard, think I'll start spoiling you like Katara. He was about to joke around with Kiwi a little longer, but Sokka's attention was drawn away when he saw some commotion in the yard. What is this delusional general up to now? General Fong's army had gathered in the training courtyard of the base. A couple of thousand soldiers stood tall, as they gazed at the mighty figure of the general. I am amongst you at this time, not as for my recreational sport, but being resolved, in the midst and heat of the battle, to live or die amongst you all, to lay down, for my manifested destiny, and my kingdom, and for my people, my honor and my blood. Let's manifest our destiny today. 
and let quote soccer observe this from the roof and couldn't help but be impressed by the general. He might have been a little delusional, but that was what made good leaders. General Fong wasn't making promises he couldn't keep or speeches he couldn't follow. He truly believed that he could do it. Damn, the Earth Kingdom is lucky to have someone like this, he muttered under his breath. I wish I had a general so delusional as to throw away his life so easily. Kiwi jumped on his shoulder and soccer petted the small creature, hearing the general and trying to determine what he was up to. Our people have suffered against the Fire Nation for so long, and we have only been on the defense trying to defend the lands that they haven't taken yet. But that will no longer be so. The general's passionate speech seemed to catch the soldiers' hearts, and soccer could tell they were excited. Finally, the Earth Kingdom would go on the attack. Due to the size of the land, most people didn't care about what the king in Ba Sing Si had to say, and the big city could keep itself hold in its walls for all they cared. General Fong was ambitious and planned to do more than just be a general after the war was over. Though the man must have thought the war to be unwinnable by just normal soldiers, Sokka observed that now Fong seemed confident. Sometimes words speak louder than actions. Better take Arn out of here before he catches sight of the brutality that's going to occur. The kid is 12, and seeing the brutality of war will break him. War is not just killing it's much, much more brutal. The worst things you can think of, soldiers have probably done during a war. It didn't matter which side you stood in a wall. You were the villain to one side. Jumping down from the roof, Sokka landed on the balcony, and saw Un was already there, gazing at the soldiers ready for war with guilt in his eyes. I Sokka, what should I do? Sokka stood next to him and put a hand on his shoulder. Right now, the best you can do is master the four elements in order. Trying to rush things will just make the situation worse. Let's politely say goodbye to General Fong and leave this place. Staying here longer could have the general end up pulling Arn into the same trick to try and pull out his Avatar State. While General Fong was right about the Avatar State being able to defeat Fire Lord Ozai. Right now the state was the same as Arn being a madman. He would injure the allies about as much as the enemy, and activating it forcefully wasn't good. Sokka didn't know everything there was about the Avatar State, but he remembered that after every Avatar mastered the four elements, they would be able to use it. Though Arn broke that cycle a little during the original story, trying to go against the balance and order of elements. There is no shortcut to this. We must just try harder to have you master the four elements. I will help you Arn, but when it comes down to it, I will do things my way. Sokka reminded him before walking back to the room and picking up their things. They needed to get out of here and continue. Arn swallowed nervously, gazing at the soldiers with a sad look in his eyes. Each day that he hasn't defeated the Fire Lord, people will die against the Fire Nation. Sokka, what would you have done if you were the Avatar? Hum. Sokka stopped picking up their things and glanced at Arn with the corner of his eye. If he had been the Avatar, then he would have been ruthless, gathered forces under him, and manipulated the situation by calling the Fire Lord out. If he came then he would kill him. If he didn't, then the Fire Lord's reputation would plummet even amongst his men, as he would be seen as a coward. Arn of course wouldn't be able to pull that off. He neither had the demeanor to be manipulative, nor the guts to act ruthless, and have a show of power. I guess I would learn the four elements first. Sokka lied without missing a beat. He didn't tell Arn what he would do, since an innocent avatar, like Arn, was infinitely easier to use than someone like Kaishi. Trust me, in your position, there isn't a lot anyone can do. Hearing Sokka's reassuring words, Arn sighed in relief, his willingness to learn all four forms of bending getting strengthened. We need to find an earthbending teacher faster. Sokka nodded. Yes, though going to a Mashu and looking for Byumi wouldn't be the best idea. Why? The avatar was confused at this, as he knew that Byumi was the best earthbender he had ever met. Even though the old man was past his prime and over a hundred years old, he still held that title in Arn's eyes. We don't know how the situation might have developed there, and the dash no. Arn yelled out, looking at Sokka fiercely. Amashu has held strong for a hundred years. They won't fall that easily. Sokka sighed but didn't say any more. He knew for a fact that Amashu had fallen, and Bumi wasn't planning on taking it back anytime soon. Well, it was debatable if he could even take it back this time around. After packing everything and going to Appa, and getting ready to set off, Arn and Sokka clapped their hands in respect towards General Fong. General, remember my advice, Sokka said, with a small smile on his face. Fong nodded in confirmation. Thank you for your warm welcome, General. I will try my best to end this war as soon as possible, Ung stated confidently. Something that he wouldn't have been able to do without Sokka by his side. Even when you're failing, show confidence, only then you're someone worth following. Ha ha ha. The general laughed out loudly. Don't worry, Avataran, we will solve this by ourselves before you even need to get involved. Though his words were supposed to be encouraging, Arn looked down sadly as he felt like everyone seemed to be losing confidence in the Avatar. Sokka saw this as the natural human cycle. Once they saw that something was unneeded, then humans would start dropping certain traditions. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Sokka remembered the quote from his last world, and couldn't help but associate the Avatar with a godlike being. How long until people kill this god? In the end, they fly away in search certain thoughts plague Sokka's mind. He also instructs Arn to move about the clouds, so they aren't seen when crossing over the Fire Nation army surrounding Amashu. 
But as they approached the once mighty city, despair dawned in Arn's face. Fire Nation banners flew up high, with red and black fluttering flags everywhere. Industrial, black smoke and fumes filled the sky with a disgusting oily smell permeating through the air. A Mashu had been taken over by the Fire Nation, and there wasn't anything that could be done about it. We have to go and save Biumi. Arn was about to have Appa fly towards Amashu, but Sokka stopped him and put a hand on his shoulder. Arn, calm down, his voice was sharp like a razor. Think about it. Yumi was a king the people admired. Killing him would only give the people a reason to be angrier about and revolt. Sokka tried to calm him, but Arn seemed reluctant to leave the only friend he had here behind. Though Sokka was worried about another thing, and it was whether Azula had planned something in case the Avatar wanted to save his friend. So with a smile, Sokka told a white lie. Come on now, Arn. We don't want to give them a reason to kill Yumi. Because if you try and save him, they'll be able to guess what you might be up to. But, I can't just dash wish. Sokka didn't let Arn finish and knocked him out with a chop to the neck. Well, that works. And he grabbed Appa's reins. Yet, yet, and changed direction away from Amashu before anyone caught sight of it. Going in that place is suicide. But Katara tried to reason, but sighed, knowing that Sokka wouldn't do something like this for nothing. We both know how this would end up for Arn. Don't disillusion yourself with the truth. Right now we can't afford to play around. Do you think Bumi is the kind of guy to let himself be captured? Even if he did, there's probably a reason behind it. He is a mad genius who held the Fire Nation back for a hundred years. Sokka reasoned trying to reassure his sister, but since he had his back turned towards her as he held onto Appa's reins, she didn't see his sour expression. Sokka had his map open, and was searching for a place to travel, in which he would find Toph. But in the map below him, there were some yellow dots. Yu Yin level 2, age 8, status. Starving, Na level 2, age 9, status. Starving, Ko's level 1, age 5, status. Starving, there were over 30 similar character tags, Looking below he saw that it was dry grassland. Clenching teeth, he knew what the logical thing to do here was, and how I needed to master the four elements faster. Fuck, what shitty luck. Why did I have to activate the damn map? Now I can't unsee this. He muttered under his breath as he passed the children's position, going to find Toph. But as soon as he started flying away, Sokka felt a strange feeling in his heart, and knew that if he did this, no matter the level of power he reached, he would regret it and think about this if he ran away. So with a tug, he turned back. Why are we turning around? Katara asked. But he didn't answer. But she got the answer as soon as Appa landed in a dry field. There were corpses all around, and the ruins of a destroyed village. Children wandered around, none of them older than ten, their eyes empty and clothes dirty. They were only skin and bones, and Carter covered her mouth as her eyes widened at the horrifying sight before her. Sokka on the other hand stared at her calmly. Wander around some towns with earthbending tournaments, and try to find an earthbending teacher for I'm Not a normal earthbender but someone who can feel the earth like Bumi could. What about you? She muttered, unsure of what she was even seeing. I am staying here, Sokka answered. For the first time he was going to leave them for real. Don't worry, after helping them I will come and find you. Just forget what you saw here and continue moving forward. But, but, Katara wanted to say something, anything, but no words came out. Seeing someone die was different from this. It tugged at someone's heartstrings. Sokka smiled at her reassuringly. Keep Kiwi always close to you and take care of Aung. Let you coolest older brother deal with this. For once, she didn't retort his ridiculous sayings, as her eyes were overshadowed as she looked down and grabbed Appa's reins. I will trust you, brother. Fix everything and come back. Appa, yep, yep. Whoosh. A great fluttering wind hit the ground as Appa set off. Sokka glanced at the tragedy, and felt his heart clench at the corpses of some starving children too. He wanted to throw up, but his gamer's mind wouldn't let him. So instead, he walked towards the forest quickly and pulled out from his inventory a giant grey boar rabbit that he had killed. The corpse of the animal was still fresh with blood spilling out of its neck. Sokka then walked back, with the giant animal on his shoulder, and went to the middle of the village, where a dry well stood. He put his hand on the wall, just outside of everyone's view, and waterbended the water that was below there, and with a great effort pulled it out, and the well started running again, taking some wood from the broken down, charred houses nearby. He started a giant blaze of fire and skinned the bull rabbit and started roasting it. Soon, scared, empty-eyed children came out of hiding and stared at Sokka cautiously. They were a little scared of the fire, but human instincts of survival crushed that fear. He didn't say anything as that most of the children were 11 years old. Adults were killed, but they didn't have the hearts to finish off the children and just left them behind to a worst fate. Whether the fire soldiers knew it would end like this or not, Sokka didn't know. Don't be afraid. I won't harm you. For the first time since coming to this world his acting skill was being used for something. But Sokka wasn't worried whether he was doing something good or not. Still, there were things he didn't like looking at. 
He knew that he couldn't go and save every single starving person in the world, but their children, he will save them all, and I will save them my way. He uttered his gaze turning cold as he peered into the fire that was roasting the animal. With his mind set on saving them, Sokka used the map function, and found a nearby river that the children didn't seem to know about. Sokka could see how they wouldn't as their parents didn't let them approach such a dangerous place, especially since there was a Fire Nation stronghold nearby. As the children slowly started approaching him and Sokka went through the houses, pulling out any plates that survived, and after washing them with the water in the well, he started putting food in them. By then it didn't matter what the children thought of him as they weren't able to hold themselves back and he filled many plates with meat. His cooking skill has prepared everything to perfection, cooking level 4 to 5 having cooked for Katara and Aang during the journey. This skill had leveled up quite a lot. Sokka glanced towards where the Fire Nation base was in the cold. Icy feelings settled in his heart. At the same time, atop Appa, Aang opened his eyes and woke up. When he came to his senses, he rapidly got up. Yumi, we have to save him. Looking around, he saw Katara atop Appa's head and guiding him where to fly. Aang looked around and didn't see Sokka. And he also noticed that they weren't anywhere close to a mashu. Katara. He called out to her. But she didn't respond. We need to dash shut up. She yelled out, stopping Arn mid-track as he looked on shocked, not expecting Katara to say something like that. Arn, we can't keep messing around and people die every single day this war continues. Every minute we waste messing around people are suffering because of the war. You need to master the four elements and defeat Fire Lord Ozai. But Bumi Dash Ung tried to make a reason for why he had to save Bumi. But Katara interrupted him again. No. Images of children starving appeared on her mind and she felt herself clenching guilt. How much time had they spent playing around and just causing trouble, riding the koi fish in Kashi Island, Amashu visit and all of this. They were just wasting time. This isn't a game. They're having fun on other people's suffering. Do you know why Sokka isn't here? Katara turned around and Aang saw tears rolling down her face and his heart sunk. While flying away from Amashu, we stumbled on a destroyed village full of starving children. Sokka stayed behind to help them. How many more like that do you think are around the world? Aang kept quiet not saying anything and looking down sadly. Sorry he felt incredibly guilty too, being reminded of running away. This is all my fault. I ran away from my duties and ended up causing the world pain due to my selfishness. Upon a remote Fire Nation outpost, a lone man stood amongst a field of corpses. There was no scratch in his body, nor any blood in his clothes. His gaze was cold as he stared at the dozen or so survivors who cowed back in fear. What they had seen wasn't something a simple human could achieve. P- please spare our lives, one of the women in the group bowed. I- dash I will do anything. Please don't kill me. I have a sick mother and father to take care of. Sokka didn't say anything and just kept staring at her coldly. But within a flash, before she could even react he was in front of them, and his spear was pointed at her neck. I don't believe in the notion of karma. All that bad deeds earn you bad luck. Some of the vilest people in the world live happy lives, so there is no reason to think of such fantasy. The Fire Nation soldiers didn't know what he was getting at, but they backed away in fear. Sokka clenched his teeth, sighed, and in a burst of speed, he disappeared. But his voice still lingered in the crisp air. When I don't like something, I twist it. With those words, he left like the wind as if he hadn't been here to begin with. Everyone there had a terrified look on their faces and a memory that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Fwish. Sokka swung through the trees at incredible speeds and arrived back to the village not much longer. One of his water clones was taking care of the children, and he looked on Somali with a small smile on his face. No matter how sometimes he wanted to be coldly logical, that sense of humanity would come and bring him back. Sigh, I can't afford to act like this again. Soft-hearted emotions will only hold me back. Especially with that guy pulling the strings. No sane man would create something like this. He opened the interface and glanced at it. Azala is in place, Arn and Katara are too. Just need to wait until Toph joins, and then everything will be ready. Sokka wanted to create an armada against Ozai, and have Azal be seen as the better alternative to lead the people. Zuko had a part in this too, but Sokka knew he couldn't charm Zuko, and the young man was a little lacking and immature when it came to leading people. Making a couple more clones in case the first one breaks away, Sokka left them instructions on how to take care of things. These children needed to survive somehow. Give a man a fish and he will eat for a day teach him how to fish, and he will feed himself for the rest of his life. At least that was the basic ideology of how things went. Sokka was going to do the same, but had to compromise a little and couldn't stay in the place forever. Leaving water clones here wouldn't be a good idea either, so he had to go and stealthily slaughter the close by Fire Nation stronghold. He left some of the soldiers alive to spread the word. His water clones wouldn't be able to deal with such big numbers, so he had to take care of them. There would be more soldiers filling the missing numbers of the dead ones, but the logistics of that were a nightmare and would take months until the message of what happened spread and a couple more months until troops arrived. By the time this place was filled with soldiers again, Sokka planned for this war to be finished. The first thing he did was take a map out of his inventory and reading he went towards a certain swamp, needing to get some water benders who would be willing to participate in this war and a plan bender too. Since I am away from the gun, I need to take care of some things I would have had to do as Sokka either way. 
It didn't take Sokka long to approach the swamplands. The giant trees as big 10-story apartment buildings were in the outskirts, and they even were considered amongst the smallest in the outskirts of the swamp. Sokka couldn't get a clear look as he was quite far away. He also remembered from the show that this same swamp also had a distinct ability to connect with everything. During the show, Sokka remembered how it was used as a way to explain how everything was connected. During this ordeal, he also kept his guard up, and made sure that no spirit would suddenly start jumping him. He had too much of an experience with that to be careless. After some hours of running at his top speeds, Sokka got a little tired, but he managed to get a handle on his running speed, so he wouldn't get tired too soon. While Gamer's body would deal with a lot of the problems of normally getting tired by being back up to their best condition, Sokka didn't want to stop anywhere at all, and finish this as soon as possible. But as he approached the swamp, he caught sight of something rapidly running after him on the map, and this made him frown. The yellow dot was approaching rapidly. That meant the thing approaching him wasn't directly an enemy but a neutral party. But that in and of itself, can mean a lot of things. Also, no one should be aware of what he was doing, or that he was here. So Sokka was curious who was so skilled as to track him down all the way here. Looking around, Sokka was in a grass field with a forest to the side. Unlike the swamp far ahead, the forest was normal, with a verge sized trees. It didn't take long for the person to show themselves. It was some giant creature that seemed like an anteater and bear. Its size was around that of Appa, just a little smaller. Sokka recognized her from the show. It was June and her pet mount that she used to track people. Seems like I have a stalker nowadays, muttered Sokka under his breath, wondering if someone had sent this woman. Who was he kidding? Of course, someone had sent her after him. As her mount turned its head towards where he was hiding, he jumped down from the tree and showed himself. You know, I am flattered with a girl as pretty as you, but I already have a girl in mind. Don't flatter yourself, she said, smiling and taking out a pamphlet of paper. She frowned as she glanced back and forth between Sokka and the paper in her hands. You smell like someone else. Did you steal his clothes or something? Oh, so she's talking about my identity as Kuzan. Then that makes sense. Now at least I know which lightning-throwing psycho sent her after me. Well, maybe it was someone else. But I am sure that it was Azala. Or her father who wanted me killed for getting too close to his daughter. Somewhat like that, Sokka glanced at her clothes, which consisted of the Fire Nation Red. Did the Fire Lord send you to kill me off? Or was it Azala? She frowned at the mention of the names, and Sokka could guess that it was one of the two, judging by her expression. He wanted to know about the person who hired her. But June didn't see to have his patience, and charged Sokka with her whip ready. Tell me where the man named Kuzan is. I have no idea what you're talking about. Sokka shrugged as he dodged the tongue of the elephant-sized animal, and then readied his spear to attack, when June's whip wrapped around his weapon. You have his smell all over you, she said, her eyes narrowing in suspicion. It's likely that you haven't been too long away from him. If you don't answer, she patted her mouth. My cute Nyla will run her tongue all over you, and trust me, you don't want that. Ham is that so? Sokka chuckled and tugged his spear, and June's eyes widened as she was easily pulled towards him. Though Sokka noticed that her strength was many times that of a normal man, which was weird for such a slim body. Fish. The mount's tongue swung out, and Sokka dodged to the side, barely, as it moved quite fast. But he had to make sure the tongue didn't even touch him, because he knew it had a paralysis agent in it. So, the Fire Lord sent you, didn't he? Sokka smiled widely. What kind of creep are you? June asked, with a weirded outlook in her eyes. Why do you seem so excited at the thought of that? Thank God, Sokka sighed in relief. I thought he would never send someone after me. Which would have sucked. Let's see how Azula reacts when she learns that her father wanted to finish off Kuzan. June's bewildered look showed her feelings on Sokka quite clearly. But he wasn't bothered by her scrutinizing gaze, being used to women looking at him like that, and instead, he observed her pet. This guy is quite fast, right? Like faster than most animals and probably could run faster and longer distances than me. He is not for sale, June stated firmly, getting up from the ground and pulling at her whip. That was wrapped around Sokka's spear. But it was to no avail as his hand didn't even budge. Sokka noticed that she was quite strong for a thin body like hers. That's okay. I wasn't going to buy him. He added with a friendly smile. I am kinder just gonna take it from you. She frowned and took out a dagger, getting ready for a deadly fight. But unlike her on guard posture, Sokka seemed very relaxed and just glanced at her mount with a scheming gaze. I have no idea how to ride one of these things. So you're gonna have to come with me. What? You think I'm just some sheep that you can dash Sokka swiped his thumb across his neck. Or else, you know people die all the time nowadays and in my defense. You did just try and track me for one of the most dangerous men in the world. If you had been successful, it could have just as well led to my death. Listen, kid, it's just business, she reasoned, understanding what he was getting at here. Refusing the Fire Lord and the great reward he offered didn't sound like a good idea at the time. He isn't the kind of guy who takes no calmly. Oh, there is no need to try and reason it with me. He nodded in agreement. I completely agree with your reason and how it's all business. What I am offering you is also business. That seemed to get her attention, and Sokka saw this, smiling and offering her the reward of the mission. If you help me today, I won't slit your throat and throw you to the side of the road to be eaten by wild animals. Like you can do Dashwish. 
Before she could say anything anymore, the tip of Sokka's spear was only an inch from digging into her throat, and she noticed that he had untied the spear from her whip that was previously wrapped around it. I don't think you understand the situation. I wasn't asking for your opinion. She nods, sweat rolling down her cheek as she glanced at the spear and the man wielding it. Sokka smiled at her and tried to make himself seem as friendly as possible. While June's actions wouldn't have had him in any likely danger, she didn't know that, and he decided to use it as a reason to have her be his ride to certain places he wanted to go. Without much persuasion, Sokka was atop the mount with June acting as his driver. He didn't bother spending any more time trying to threaten, and his demeanor changed to his usual friendly self. Just keep going forwards towards those swamplands, he pointed towards a faraway place, barely within the view of the normal human eye, and it was surrounded by trees, and kept getting bigger the deeper one looked. That place is dangerous, she warned him, but by the trace of nervousness in her voice, Sokka could tell that she was nervous. Who would want to go into a dangerous place with someone who threatened them? He understood her worries but didn't care about them for now. Sokka knew he needed to finish this as soon as possible. During this critical time he felt nervous leaving Katara alone, and also it seemed like Ozai was worried enough to send someone after him. Well, more like sending someone after Kuzan, who had gotten his hands in Azala. The swamp was a dangerous place, and Sokka could smell the wetness in the air, with the gross smell of moldy grass. The shade from the giant trees made things darker, allowing predators to hide, and with strange sounds coming out from all directions, it was a very uncomfortable place to be in. June's mount continued to move with agility through the not-so-deep waters. Nyla won't be able to go on for much longer as the waters get deeper, June said worryingly, glancing at Sokka's spear, as her words left her mouth. Don't worry. I won't kill you, Sokka reassured. Sometimes I threaten people. That way they listen easier. But it isn't in my nature. I don't know, you seem pretty natural at it, June retorted, a small smoke adorning her face. He could tell that she was trying to soften the mood between them and get rid of this tense atmosphere. So Sokka played along, says the unnaturally violent girl. I almost felt my arms about to rip off when you tug at my spear. That's a suggestive joke, she smirked. But her gaze soon turned serious. I don't know why the Fire Lord is after you, Dash. You mean Kuzan, right? Sokka diverted, knowing that by now her mount should have confirmed that by smell. He and Kuzan were the same person. She didn't add more into that, but her gaze was a suspicious one. I have heard that some assassins can change their faces. Are you one of them? Looking around, Sokka notices from the corner of his eye that some vines under the muddy waters are moving as if they have a mind of their own. Hum, if I was then I wouldn't tell you. He responded vaguely, while his eyes followed the moving vines. But right now, there is another thing to worry about. She nodded, looking around. Yeah. I can feel the eyes of a predator gazing at me. We're being watched. More than just watched, Sokka whispered under his breath, and as soon as he did so, vines burst from underwater, and like whips, they showed towards him. Fwish. Fwish. He cut dozens of vines easily as if they were made of butter. But suddenly even more vines burst out of the water. So Sokka grabbed June by her hand and threw her up as vines grabbed her mount and dragged it underwater. Nyla. June yelled out in distress. But Sokka quickly appeared behind her mid-air and grabbed into a tree branch with one hand while holding her leg with the other. Stop worrying about your pet too much, Sokka advised June, pulling himself and her up the tree branch. It would have been worse off if you got captured. He tried to console her, but June flipped him off. You bastard. Do you know how much money Nyla makes me? Those vines stole my way of living. Sokka stared at her weirdly, having thought that June might be worried for her pet for a second. But to her, Nyla getting dragged away was the same as her pile of money getting stolen. Don't worry, your pet will just be eaten by some hillbilly waterbenders. Nothing too strange. Sokka muttered patting her shoulder in comfort. Help me get him back, June snorted, and then hazed towards the direction Nyla was taken. And I will give you some secret information about the Fire Lord. New quest Sokka dismissed the notification as soon as it came. Tell me the information first, he didn't want something that he already knew. Having seen the show, he knew a lot more than most. What if you don't keep your end of the bargain? June narrowed her eyes to suspiciously at him. Sokka shrugged. Well, I have your life in my hand, so that should help, right? Of course, he was going to help her either way, as a tracker like June owing him a favor was something he could use later on. Or in case it's not a favor, helping her would make June see him in a better light for possible future deals. The Fire Lord is getting remarried. That stopped Sokka's thoughts as he looked at June, wide-eyed. His skin tingles at the news. Or maybe that was the mosquitoes here. Ozai getting married. Sokka felt a chill run down his spine as countless bad scenarios played in his head. He crushed such fear as soon as it came and calmed down. All of it happened so fast that to June it seemed like he did not react at all. Why is that bastard getting remarried? Does he want a new child? Has he already lost hope in Azala? Sokka needed to turn the situation around, and knew that a third child being born within the royal family of the Fire Nation would mess up the plans he had worked so hard for. Every small detail calculated everything he is doing. The time spent, in the end, it would be for nothing. Do I have to go and assassinate the Fire Lord by my own hands? 
Even though that would ruin everything and make the situation extremely unfavorable for me. It might be another Northern Water Tribe situation where someone more competent takes over. At least then it had some benefit as the knowledge of the ocean and moon spirits disappeared with Zhao. If everything went down the drain like this, then he should have killed the Fire Lord from the beginning, by sneaking into the palace and teleporting out. Of course, that would likely develop into an anarchic civil war, with the Fire Nation possibly self-destructing, and the Earth Kingdom turning into the attackers. Sokka didn't want to end up in a Hydra situation, kill one leader and two anarchists will take its place. In the modern world he came from, the chance of something like anarchy was almost ludicrous and unthought of in strong nations. But in a world like this, many people were hungry for power. The modern world might not be perfect, but it has opportunities and encourages less bloodshed. Of course, that also kept ambitious people from needing to spill a river of blood to get to their goals. Ambitious people could make it up the chain the regular way and become the leader of their country, the highest authority of power. Sure they might have to get their hands dirty a couple times, but in the end, it was a means to a goal. In this world though, or essentially in a medieval world with king and queens, you have to take matters into your hand. For one person's ambitions, thousands, no, tens of thousands or more would die. The world could turn upside down and drown in blood. But that will be nothing in the eyes of someone ambitious. Even the gamer interface is kinda shit when compared to human ambition. No, this thing was probably created by human ambition too. I need to finish things up here before Ozai gets a successor. I have even less time than I had planned. Sokka noticed June looking at him weirdly, as if waiting for him to say something or have some kind of reaction. So he smiled reassuringly. Don't worry, I will help you either way. Though I might add, this information isn't that useful. She frowned, opening her mouth to say something. But no words came out. In the end, she sighed and nodded in agreement, deciding to hold in, something. Sure, as long as you help me. I don't care what your intentions are. I am an honest guy, Sokka said with an innocent gaze in his eyes. Shun stared at him, even knowing what kind of guy he was. It seemed like she was tricked by his compelling act for a second. But she soon came to her senses, shaking her head and concentrating on the situation at hand. Shun narrowed her eyes, showing clear suspicion, and not bothering to hide it. This was a signal to Sokka, show him that she wasn't stupid and knew of his games. That's not what an honest guy would say. Also, I know that the information I gave you is valuable, stop trying to scam me. He felt his heart shatter into a million pieces metaphorically. June was a very valuable ally to have and seeing that she was conscientious of his acts made him want to throw a tantrum. But he didn't and held onto his calm demeanor. Twisting people into what you wanted them to be was something Sokka had learned in his first life and perfected in this one. Though to others it might sound twisted, he had remembered the days such a skill was used to keep his family back on earth together. A child having to learn something like this, the circumstances needed, he wouldn't wish on anyone else. This made him feel a sense of loss. Since coming to this world, his scamming abilities had leveled up quite a lot, though that wasn't something the gamer interface measured. Though his situation was much direr than he let it show, the skills that had helped him make his life into a tragedy during the first time, were now helping him as they did in his childhood. Sokka wanted to throw up, but of course, he won't. Whether that was Gamer's body in effect, or his cold logic twisting him to be the perfect version of himself, he didn't know. It's very unpleasant to be around people who know my true nature, Sokka admitted being reminded of Katara, and how even now she doesn't know her true self. For a split second, he thought of how she would react to how he truly was, but decided to not contemplate such depressing thoughts. Azula was like this too. Maybe if I can charm June and act like a hard-to-get man she will chase after me. Everyone loves a hard chase. Now I just need to play it right, so I don't seem arrogant and make myself desirable, a prize to catch. Once again, that twisting nature of Sokka showed its head, the part of him that he didn't like, but had to use against a common enemy. If you get to know me, then we might get along, as I am not as bad as you think. I was also tasked with tracking you at one point, Sokka of the Southern Water Tribe, June muttered suddenly. Her voice a little hollow, with a sprinkle of fear sprinkled into it. Her eyes peered at him. The fake calmness radiating around her was something that made Sokka want to chuckle. Even though she was good at keeping up a facade, Sokka could see her jittering, and her pupils expand to an unnatural degree. He knew that all these pointed to her being afraid, instinctually at least, if not rationally. But everywhere I went, you were described as a hero, June said in a melancholic tone as his eyes dropped towards the muddy swamp waters. Someone who always wins, in certain places you were even more popular than the Avatar, and that's damn terrifying. He is God in human flesh, and having someone else overtake him in popularity is despairing. It's as if the thousands of lives an Avatar went through are something you can climb over easily. Well, when the Avatar is a 12-year-old child, who had just abandoned the world for a hundred years, then yes, it is quite easy to trump him. Sokka remembered June from the original show as just another side character with limited detail. But now, she was a real person with complex thoughts and reasoning. I am glad some people see me as a hero, though in my humble opinion, he stopped for a couple of seconds to raise the feeling of awkwardness June was feeling. I'm just another guy who was lucky at a point in his life. 
Calling me greater than the Avatar is just an exaggeration. Sokka tilted his head, glancing at the water below them, narrowing his eyes to see if there were any moving vines or unforeseen danger around. He acted as if he didn't notice her eyes glance towards the spear in his hand. I will be honest with you, she remarked reluctantly. You're some dangerous guy who I don't want to mess with. Just help me get Nihilaya, and I will not speak a word to the Fire Lord about you. That's good, but don't worry. I will help you anyway. I'm just waiting to see if there are any waterbenders nearby. If he was alone, he wouldn't have worried too much, as most dangers can be survived by Gamer's body. But she is different, one bad hit, and her guts will spill out. As I am sure the rumors clearly stated, I am a nice guy. The small chuckle that overtook June, before she stopped herself, made it clear just how much she trusted that statement. So you won't kill me then? June asked, and the fear in her gaze became clearer. Sokka smiled, feeling back in control, as he now understood where she was coming from. I am a hero, so of course not, knowing that June understood what was best for survival. Sokka knew that she wouldn't tell anyone anything. She was like his past self in his first life bravado gets you killed. So better know when to shut the hell up. Instead, I will save you. So act like the victim, okay? She nodded. Yes, but I am into women, so don't expect me to spread my legs for you. Even if I was into guys, assuming that I owe you sex for saving me is ludicrous and creepy. Ha 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 ha. Sokka laughed at her honesty. He couldn't help it. Finally, someone who was logical and easy to deal with had appeared. That's a shame, you're truly my type. After saying that, he jumped off the tree. The giant leap that he made surprised June. But he wasn't bothered as this way he would at least be able to show his power. Bam the water around him made a huge splash as he landed, obscuring his view. Vines spurted out of the water, taking advantage of this lack of vision. The wet dark green vines with some grey on them burst through the water. Fwish, fwish, fwish. But Sokka's spear was like a flash, his high agility helping him cut through wet vines like a hot knife. Everything was a blur, even to him as his spearmanship skill level had surpassed what his stats would be able to keep up with. But that wasn't a problem, his body knew where to move and what to do. There was a sense of perfect control within the range of his spear. Using the map his view was covered more, on top of the water splash. But with the skill sense danger his body didn't halt at all, even though he could barely see the vines. Catching sight of the location of the big red dot, Sokka kicked off the water, freezing the murky liquid where he would walk, creating a path towards the big red dot, and within an instant, he was in front of a giant vine monster that was hiding behind one of the bug swamp trees. Manipulating the water around him, Sokka made an ice spear. Due to controlling the water carefully and making sure no air was trapped inside, he created a clear ice spear that was almost invisible to the eye. He cut off the head of the vine monster in one swing, and started butchering the vines as fast as he could until only a wide-eyed, chubby man wearing leaves as underwear was left. He had a scared look in his eyes, but then noticed that Sokka wasn't attacking after cutting up the vines. Whoa! The man exclaimed in amazement even as Sokka pointed his spear at his throat, while the clear ice spear turned back into water, causing it to splash in the murky waters below. But the man was not bothered by it. How many insect eggs did you eat? You're mighty strong, and Mama used to say that insect eggs make a man strong. This is it, thought Sokka, ready to preach his grandeur speech he had prepared. Will you join Dash? Yes, I'll join you, the chubby man answered without missing a beat. Sokka, having spent hours preparing a speech that would turn the heads of many people, didn't know how to feel about this. Dash June she could feel it, like the kiss of cold wind, Sokka was strange. Having grown in a rough part of the Earth Kingdom, June knew how to read a certain kind of people. There was an aura around them. No, there's no vile aura, nor is their appearance something that might draw suspicion. But as she saw what Sokka did, a chill ran down her spine. Though no matter how hard she tried to dismiss such a feeling, June knew the young man she met was dangerous. No, dangerous was an understatement for Sokka. Usually, you would get a warning, or a sign when someone has malicious thoughts about you. But Sokka was different, June knew that if he wanted her dead, she wouldn't know of it. Maybe he already wanted to kill her. Such thoughts brought a freezing chill down her spine which made her hands shake. But taking a breath, she was able to calm down. No, I must calm down. June was scared of him, more than Sokka knew. And she wanted to keep it that way. She had stumbled into a secret of his. And he didn't seem like the kind of guy who would leave loose ends. She could feel the chill run down her spine as her instinct screamed at her to run away. But June held her ground, knowing that running away isn't an option. From what she had seen so far, it seemed like Sokka could cut her neck before she could even react. The chubby man controlling the vines said something and smiled at Sokka. But being so far away, June couldn't hear any of it. Don't judge someone by their words, but by their actions only then can you understand what they're after. She knew that well. So to get a better read on Sokka, she had to try her best as she inched closer. But traveling atop swamp trees wasn't effortless as they were very wet, and you could slip easily. I can tell with very little doubt that Sokka is a master manipulator. Nobody is perfect, yet everywhere I went, everyone would speak well about him. Even some Fire Nation soldiers spoke of his righteous demeanor. Back then I had the gut feeling that someone like him was too dangerous to handle. Fuck my luck. Initially, June thought her mission was easy. She never picked any dangerous missions as of late, all of that precaution she took was due to a gut feeling. 
just in case. Or, June, come and greet our new friend, his disgustingly sweet voice rang out. It was like a gentle prickle in her ear, that seemed to make all of June's worries fade away. A voice that puts people at ease, what a dangerous ability for someone like him. The chances of him killing me after this is over keep increasing the more I get to know him. I will become one of the countless people he will kill to keep his reputation clear. After a regretful sigh, June jumped down into the swamp waters. The gross, strange smell was the first thing that came to mind as she got closer to the muddy waters. Squelch her feet sank into the water, and it felt like she had stepped in some bug. Also, her landing created a splash that caused swamp water to cover her whole body. She would have been mad at Sokka and even punched him for making her do something like this. Should she still try it? After all, guys always go back against girls, and this act could be used to improve their relationship, make her seem more human, so he doesn't kill her in the end. Right, I value my life too much. From his behavior, there's a very high chance that he won't even care at all. Walking towards Sokka, she tried to keep a nonchalant vibe. She didn't know how effective it was though as Sokka only smiled amusingly at her. Suddenly, he twirled his spear with a smile on his face. While looking at her, June felt her heart about to beat out of her chest. When a human is in a danger as a human had three possible responses wish. His spear was like a flash, cutting through the wind ruthlessly. June couldn't move away in time. No matter how hard she tried, time around her seemed to slow down, and tears as most swelled in her eyes. Was this what it meant that your life will flash before your eyes, and people say that time will slow down before you die? June didn't know, but her breath got stuck as Sokka's spear flew right past her cheek. EZZZTA buzzing sound rang next to her ear, and a warm liquid spilled on her face. Looking towards where the blood came from, the smell of iron permeating the air. June's body cringed as she saw a giant mosquito, the size of a human child. But a spear had pierced its body and pinned it into a tree. I was too distracted to pay attention to my surroundings. June acknowledged that her fear had gotten in the way of seeing things palpably. June, this is you. Our new comrade that will help us with the Fire Nation problem. The way he said it made it seem like the Fire Nation was our problem. But June didn't have the guts to refute him, knowing that calling out on it might leave her with no guts at all. Nice to meet you, was all June was able to say out loud, as Sokka's gentle gaze felt like a trickling knife running around her forehead. After that the situation became peaceful, Sokka promised some things to the swamp waterbenders, and they returned Nyla. The whole situation was solved relatively peacefully, and June was grateful for that, as she didn't want to try fighting the waterbenders in their field, the swamps. While Sokka seemed to handle it easily, she wasn't monstrously fast like him. As they got out of the swamp, June felt a burst of happiness inside her, though Sokka was riding on Nyla too and was grabbing at her midsections. By the way, what did you say to the people there? Juna inquired curiously, wondering how he was able to talk his way out of a fight after entering their land, and even threatening one of their friends. She assumed he was threatening them as he had pointed a spear at the vinebender's throat. They didn't seem like the kind of people that would give up easily on their food. For a few seconds, only Nyla's steps and breathing were heard as silence permeated their conversation. But Sokka suddenly whispered in her ear, I can be quite convincing when I want to. Those words made a chill go down her spine. Or maybe it was due to their proximity that made her so on guard of him. But June could tell that Sokka was hiding many things, and knew better than to try to intervene in his plans. At first, she had thought that the Fire Lord had just sent her to track the Fire Princess's secret lover or something. But the situation had now become more than she could handle. So where are we going now? June tried to change the direction of the conversation for some reason, feeling that the silence between them was too awkward. Though she can't describe why. Was it his demeanor, or maybe the way he speaks? His chin leaned on my shoulder like that of a long-time lover. Can you take me to the Bifong family residence? Yes. She nodded without hesitation. Everyone knows where the Bifong family resides. Hopefully, I can get out of his clutches as soon as possible. This guy gives me the creeps. Hopefully you aren't thinking of something bad about me. He whispered jokingly, bringing an icy feeling throughout her body. Because having a girl that I like as much as you think bad about me isn't good about my self-esteem at all. You fucker. At least act like you're trying to lie. But the amused smile on your face clearly shows that you're entertained by the situation and aren't even bothering to hide it. Turning around, June gazed at his face, which had that innocent look and smile on it. That smile would have made any girl's heart skip a beat. Not June's though. To her, it was unsettling just how easy this harmless act seemed to come to him. In two days, we should be able to arrive at the Bifongs. By then I should have a chance to get away from him. Toph was in her garden, enjoying one of her leisurely walks. Like always, they were dull. She couldn't wait until the next Earth Rumble tournament came around. But suddenly, she sensed someone appearing behind her as he casually jumped over the wall. His weight and steady posture were of someone she was familiar with. But she could tell that he was physically very fit and likely a good fighter. If I told anyone that one of the greatest earthbenders in the world was a blind young girl, they would laugh at me, the person behind her said. 
The natural innocence in his voice was discarded by his words. I don't know what you're talking about, Toph insisted, ready to fight the stranger at any sign of a shift in his posture. She didn't need to look at him in the traditional way to know what she was doing. But I will scream if you don't get out of here. Sorry Dash, the earth cracked before Sokka could finish his words when. A rock as big as his head was shot at his stomach. He was barely able to dodge due to the close distance as he stepped back, and barely was able to tilt his body out of the way. He is fast, Toph thought, before gathering rocks and trapping his feet to the ground. Now you can't escape. But she was in for a surprise as Sokka brute forced his way out. It wasn't earthbending, just pure strength which Toph found to be ludicrous. A human body shouldn't move like that, and it wouldn't be able to handle breaking through rock that easily, unless they were an earthbender too. But she didn't sense any earthbending from Sokka. Ow, that hurts, he exclaimed, but Toph was able to tell due to her, sensing that he wasn't feeling any pain, and just acting as if it hurt. You're an amazing earthbender, as expected. Have you ever thought about some youthful experience, like fighting against the Fire Nation? I don't care about any of that, Toph declared, creating a large earth pillar that blasted Sokka away and slammed him into the walls that were used to protect the house. Toph was surprised again, as Sokka got up casually after such a devastating hit. How about a bet then? You dash normally Toph would have accepted his bet, but she didn't even bother letting him talk. Turning the ground below him into mud, and having an earth pillar hit his chest, slamming him into the wall again. He is too calm when offering that deal. Even scammers are usually nervous internally, even if they don't show it. But this guy is too calm. Even when I hit him, he seemed unworried, and I could sense his gaze look once again, like an undead from a fairy tale. Sokka got up, cracked his neck, and smiled widely. Wow, you're one of the hardest people I have had to convince. Was Sokka's luck with women getting worse? No, he knew that if there was one thing that he believed in himself, then it would be his fate-defying luck. Still, he could see that Toph wasn't willing to join him, and no amount of luck could manipulate her mind. But of course, like any other stalker, he wasn't going to give up so soon. Though he wouldn't consider himself a creep, just someone who does stalker-like behavior. Sokka shook his head, dismissing any weird side thoughts distracting him. He also knew many possible ways that he could convince her, though their effectiveness depends. Everyone has a plan until reality punches them in the face, and while Sokka could try to calculate through all the possible alternatives, he wasn't omniscient or outknowing. There were many things he couldn't take into account here. But even through all that, he would be good with coming up with something on the fly. But that was when another problem would arise. The biggest worrying factor and why having Toph see things his way was likely to fail. Gamer's mind was a good, amazing skill. Something so otherworldly that wouldn't let anyone mentally influence Sokka and it would crush anything that tried to invade his mind. But that same skill had many side effects. Sokka knew that due to the skill, Toph probably didn't sense anything from him, just like a cold, emotionless rock. While that wasn't true on the inside as his feelings were still there, Gamer's mind and body would make him appear calm to her senses, even if he wasn't. He could understand why anyone wouldn't trust someone she couldn't read at all and appeared so calm. This is an annoying obstacle, but not something I hadn't planned beforehand. Everyone can be bought, though sometimes, the price isn't always money. How about I teach you a new form of earthbending? He laid it out directly, no sidestepping the issue or trying to outmaneuver Toph. This wasn't a situation where he could use his innocent looking face to try and have girls agree with him. His expression was still gentle, just in case anyone was observing. June likely is. But against Toph, his axe had no effect at all. I am going to scream now, Toph said simply, taking a deep breath, getting ready to do what she had just said. Since he didn't seem like a bad guy, she at least gave him a warning. But Sokka was still very suspicious. Fwish. But before she could do anything, Sokka was right in front of her with his hand covering her mouth. How about we keep this quiet, little princess? I really mean it when I said that I will teach you new forms of earthbending. As proof, he took out a scalpel and slashed it across his hand. Blood dripped out and formed into the shape of a star. You see, bending is amazing, and you haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. Brushing his hand aside, Toph frowned, but she didn't scream, so Sokka saw that as some progress. So you want me to follow you? A sketchy man who suddenly appeared and was told to come with him. Also, your twisted bloodbending doesn't help at all. It makes you seem like the villain. Hearing that, Sokka smiled. That's where you're mistaken. I am the good guy here. Also, it wasn't like I would ever be able to meet you the regular way. How would I even go about that? Ask your parents if I can see their young daughter. That sounds like something that would get me put in jail. Can you imagine what happens to cute, innocent-looking guys, like me, in jail? She looked at him confused. What happens to them? Oh, right, this world doesn't have the internet so kids her age can't learn such things. Sokka remembered that his reference wouldn't be understood by anyone. Sighing, Toph shook her head. But she knew that what Sokka said was true. It would have taken him years to even meet her parents if he went by the regular route, let alone her. They would have been both in their 50s when they met. The Bifong family wasn't at a size that would pay attention or grant someone an audience just because they asked. Sorry, but I have a tournament to go to soon, and I dash metalbending. That one word made Toph stop in her words. 
Her eyes widened for a split second. That's impossible. Every earthbender knows that even the children. Yes, and a blind girl can't be one of the best earthbenders in the world. Sokka retorted with a small smile on his face. Even children know that. Letting go of her body. He started walking away and was about to jump over the wall. But turning toward her one last time, Toph could feel the smile on his face widening. Metal is but a part of refined earth, of course, an earthbender can manipulate it. Don't let common sense cloud your creativity, Toph. I am confident you will one day become the greatest earthbender to ever live. But before that happens, don't limit your mind with poisonous norms of normalcy. After all, you're already a very special girl. Sokka remembered just how strong Toph was by the time Avatakora came around. By then, this little girl would be an old woman, but still, her bending would have reached an unimaginable level, something that no one before her had reached. Even as a blind woman, she would establish some kind of link with the swamp she lived in, and have the ability to sense everything being able to keep an eye on her daughters, when they were on the other side of the world. By then, Sokka wondered if even Gamer's mind would be able to deceive her. But for now, he knew that she couldn't sense his real intentions. I truly believe that you have the potential to be the greatest earthbender to ever walk the earth. After saying that, he jumped over the wall in a very casual leap. That created a crack on the ground he jumped from. Toph fixed the ground like it was before with just a twitch of her hand. With a contemplative look on her face, she walked back home, a small, almost unnoticeable rush to her steps. I need to find something made of metal. Thought Toph desperately wanting to try what she had heard. While she had outwardly dismissed him, deep inside she was someone passionate about the one thing in her life she could control. When dinner came around, Toph's parents noticed that she was acting weird. She stared at her spoon while drinking her soup. Toph, dear, is something wrong? Inquired her mother worriedly. Even her father became worried when he noticed that his daughter wasn't acting like she usually would. Since she could sense from the vibrations on the grounds if people were lying. Toph knew her parents were very worried. Usually, they were always worried for the smaller things when nothing happened. But seeing that she wasn't eating her soup, Toph knew that her mother likely would call the best doctor in the Earth Kingdom by tomorrow. So she hurriedly, but at the same time elegantly drank her soup. Sorry, she smiled happily at them. I just had some thoughts in mind and was distracted. Her father silently stared at her. If you're sure, dear. But remember, if you feel uncomfortable in any way, tell us. Her mother still was worried. Okay? Toph nodded, and as she got up, a female servant came forward to escort the young lady to her room. The movements were skillful. This was already a routine. What neither her mother nor father noticed was that the spoon Toph was using previously was now missing. Back in her room, Tops clenched the spoon in her hand, and it rigidly and crudely morphed into a crumbling metal creak. Creak. The sound of metal bending in strange ways was a little loud, so she had to stop. But slowly a smile came to her. He was right quote she would have felt proud if this was her achievement, but it wasn't. Instead, she felt stupid for limiting herself to other people's perceptions of bending. When she, herself, was an exception to the rules being a good, blind earthbender. Sokka stood atop the roof of a restaurant building which had the perfect view into Toph's room. At first, he was alone, with only the wind keeping him company. But not long after, June joined to see what he was up to. You, you know that the Bifong family's daughter is only 11, right? Of course I do. Sokka nodded, not bothering himself to think what June might make out of this situation. But she's amazing. Truly the future greatest earthbender to ever live. If Bumi and a certain other man weren't around, then without a question she would already be the best. June didn't say anything to that. At first she thought about trying to tease him. But she knew that Sokka wasn't the kind of guy who would lust after a young girl. He probably wouldn't even lust after the prettiest woman, as she was confident in her analysis. As she thought of how it would look if a pretty woman came to try and seduce him, June could picture Sokka roughly pushing her aside and walking off, which made her chuckle a little. She knew for a fact through her mount when Sokka had complimented her, he had released no hormones that are usually associated with when someone feels a certain way for another person, or even lusting after them. A person so cold-hearted that he can get an unbroken iron fist through his emotions, control them to such an inhuman degree. Even the instincts of his body respond to his commands. June made many assumptions that she saw were logical. By the way, June, why haven't you left my side yet? After all, you already did your job. Sokka suddenly asked her. She didn't know whether it was a casual conversation, or he was trying to pick her mind apart. Yeah, I did your job, but what about the Fire Lord? You think he will let me go like this? I know you're smart enough to see this. But at least act like you care enough to contemplate my dire situation for a split second. If you thought about it, someone like you should be able to see it. Also, who knows if you're going to cut me off like a loose end as soon as I leave your side. June was cursing at him internally, but on the outside, she smiled charmingly. Oh, I don't know. I never had a brother, and she never wanted one either. But the energy you give off is like a protective shield of an older sibling. 
Okay? Okay? Sokka interrupted, waving her off. He was more interested in Toph's progress as she had already gained a deep understanding of metal bending, being able to form the spoon in her hand into the shape of a star, dog, and many other things. The last thing he wanted to hear was June's story. Also, he added without bothering to look at her. Don't lie to me. I can tell when someone lies. That was only somewhat the truth, as it was mostly his acting skill that allowed him to see through that, and good enough actors could easily bypass that. But he had something the gamer interface didn't account for, and that was common sense. To see through acts like this he just needed to think logically, and knowing how June acted until now, only a fool would assume that her words were genuine. Don't worry, I am not the kind of guy who will kill you for some small discretions. Even if you run off whenever you feel that things come down, don't worry, it's a small thing that I won't be troubled over. Especially not enough to kill you. Sokka reassured her, can you imagine how tiring it would be to chase you? No thanks. I don't want to do something so annoying for hardly any profit. June smiled and nodded politely, feeling like she was next to a lion. That's what everyone who kills people over small matters says. But it's better to have a monster on your side than against you. The Fire Lord won't be able to touch me, as long as I stay by your side. Sokka had made quite a reputation for himself, which had caused quite a lot of desertion from the Fire Nation army. His fighting powers could only be matched by his charisma. Though she hadn't heard them herself, June knew of some of the speeches Sokka had given. Sokka had calculated the risks involved in the plan to get Toph to his side. Amongst the many things, one major change stood out the most. Toph's confidence in herself. That was the biggest risk involved with the strategy he is using. In the original series, she had figured out metal bending by herself. So that had built within Toph unbreakable confidence in her abilities. But now, Sokka had roughed up that plan, and made things move by faster. Sure, he might not have directly taught her metal bending, but just telling her about its existence changed her perspective. Since he predicted Toph's possible confidence problems, Sokka thought of many ideas on how he could help with that. But in the end, everyone has a plan until they're confronted by reality. So of course, like any competent stalk app observing person, Sokka made sure to keep an eye on everything Toph did throughout the next day. And he could understand better now why Toph wanted to do something like joining the Earth Rumble tournament or run away with the Avatars group. Because her life was miserable, the most exciting part of her day was casually walking in the yard alone, most of the time escorted by guard. Was that a life worth living? Sure, she might have all her needs met, and might never have to worry about anything. But human life without adversity was instinctively something boring. During this time of observation, for some strange reason he couldn't be bothered to try and comprehend, June kept tagging along with him. Sokka's thoughts on June differed, as he knew she was a mercenary, someone who would offer fighting and tracking services for a price. Sure, he might keep his distance from her, only giving the woman information with sprinkles of truth, where it would end up being beneficial for him. But at the end of the day, he was also protecting her. His act of not caring about her situation didn't make him completely oblivious to it. June knew how she would end up if the Fire Lord himself heard of her transaction. Thinking of her abilities, he couldn't help but exclaim, Huh, you're pretty compatible to be an assassin. Your skills are very suited for it. If you're trying to convince me to kill someone for you, then the answer is no. June replied without missing a beat. Assassination was a dangerous thing, as it could brew hatred. When you kill someone, the people they live behind will come after you for revenge. Even she knew that getting involved in it would end up with her likely dead. Don't kill if you're not prepared to die. While the saying itself might not hold a deep meaning at face value, it also meant that if you killed someone, they had people close to them who would cry and come to kill you. Of course, I won't force you to do anything. I was just commenting on your abilities. Sokka shook his head. He understood quite well how killing someone could end. He understood that out there in the world probably were some people who hated him, as he had killed someone close to them. But he was prepared for people to hate him. Anyway, it's time to go and help the orphans around here. Keep an eye on Toph and me. Though if you don't want to then you don't have to. Fwish. He disappeared in a burst of speed, leaving behind only empty air and rushing wind. That gently blew June's hair. ECH. I can never get used to that, no matter how many times I see it. June always felt a sense of powerlessness at his burst of speed. It wasn't something a human was supposed to be able to do. Sigh. At least try and act like you're normal around me, as you do around other people. Unlike many other women Sokka had interacted with, June lacked the naivety and innocence of mind they had. So, she knew he wanted her. Well, not in the way most would think. He wasn't the kind of man to let his lower head do the thinking. Sokka wanted her to work exclusively for him. He gave the illusion of a choice. But June knew there was one. Every word he spoke, she couldn't tell if it was a lie or the truth. Knowing that you're falling into the lion's mouth, but having no choice other than to do it. Glancing back and forth between Toph and where Sokka dashed towards June's curiosity got the best of her. 
Knowing that observing Toph so much wasn't necessarily needed, Sokka had only told her to do it since she was here. You know what, if I'm going to die anyway I want to at least know the killer. June was curious about one thing. Why does Sokka visit the slums every day? Of course, the first answer that came to her mind was that he probably is preparing the orphans to be his soldiers in the future, and install a sense of debt towards him into their hearts. Maybe he is kidnapping them for notorious experiments. Only more thoughts of Sokka's notorious deeds crumpled in June's mind. So in the end, unable to control her curiosity, she went towards the slums too. If he kills me, then that will be it. Seems like my fate wasn't meant to extend further. Everyone dies one day. My time might have just come today. It didn't take long for her to arrive in the slums, and as expected, the streets were dirty, and a bad odor terminated the broken down houses, filthy streets, and smoky air. If there was a definitive picture of slums and what they looked like, then this was it. As they say, in every town, there are places where sketchy people gather, a place full of the poor, where the rich and powerful don't care about. That was the slums. For a young woman like June, with a relatively nice face and body, this place was filled with hungry wolves, and she looked like a delicious sheep. Even before entering the slums, she could feel their hungry gazes. But when she entered, those gazes turned into those of starving wolves. What happens in the slums stays there. That was the unspoken rule. No matter if your family was killed, or your sister raped, keep it to yourself and take revenge on your own. No one wanted the guards snooping around here. If you spoke something, it wasn't just you who was in danger but your loved ones too. This was a matter of teaching a lesson and keeping the status quo. As June walked down those dangerous streets, it didn't take long for a burly man, wearing tattered clothes, a bald head with no hair, and a golden tooth approached her. He was the epitome of looking like the local mobster. Young lady, this is a dangerous place. But unlike his appearance, the man warned her, which was a nice surprise for everyone, even the inhabitants. June smiled at him, a cocky smirk making its way to her face. Don't worry. I know how to take care of myself. She had grown in a place like this, and with her overbearing and unnatural strength, June dominated her local slums. The man could only sigh as he walked off. Well, I did warn you. Nowadays places like this have grown dangerous, but it's still the home I grew up in. So I don't want bad things happening to the people here. Unlike his appearance, it was clear that the man had a kind heart. June sighed, thinking of Sokka and how his natural naive looking, kind and nice face, hit such a vicious man, really shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Sokka has that innocent face that is borderline cute, but behind that hides such a cold man. As she went in deeper, the condition of the streets and the houses along them deteriorated with each step she took. It seemed like everything was getting worse. Finally, she reached the deepest parts of the slums, where the smell of shit and flies persisted through the air. Dead animals littered the streets, and the smell of death wasn't something that could ever be washed away. But what she saw surprised her. Sokka, unlike in her imagination, where he would be torturing, killing, experimenting, or maybe being the local mob boss, or the guy who controls the criminal underworld behind the shadows. Yes, she had let her imagination run a little bit wild on this one. But instead, it was the sound of clean rushing water that greeted her as Sokka controlled a huge pond of water, washing the streets clean and with the help of earthbenders who seemed to be in their early teens. He opened canals, cleaned the water repeatedly, and the streets behind him were clear. It was as if a holy saint was walking through the streets. What was behind was clean and sparkled. There was even a group of builders and earthbenders fixing the houses. A couple of urchin earthbender kids were also helping him by opening up tunnels from underground. Sir Soccer, we have connected all the SOA tunnels, as you said. Remember, collaborative bending can achieve a lot more than when you're alone. Soccer instructed them as he cleaned up the streets in which stones had turned a dark green due to mold. June wouldn't be surprised if some nasty pandemic started here by how dirty everything was. Still what surprised her was Soccer and his behavior. He didn't seem like the kind of guy who would do something like this. Even if he had a somewhat good heart, there needed to be some benefits to doing this. June even thought that maybe he had multiple personalities in him or something like it. But such thoughts were dismissed. He had spent many days by his side now, and while Sokka might be a little cold, his mental stability was undeniable. Hey, so he had a side like this too. A saint and a sinner. I have never seen such a dual-natured person. This guy isn't so bad after all. She couldn't help herself as she smiled at him. But right at that moment Sokka turned and looked at her. Immediately, June froze in place as she came to her senses. Yes, as an adult woman with experience, she knew this looked. A girl looking at a man working with a smile on her face. Oh no, he is going to assume that I am in love with him or something. Sokka POV. Why the hell is she looking at me like that? Has she gone crazy? Doesn't she have anything better to do? Jeez, woman. Go find someone else to smile at. If you're gonna just keep staring, it would be better if you came and helped. She finally came to her senses and tried to run away. But a tendril of water I manipulated, grabbed onto her ankle and dangled the woman upside down in front of me. E dash this isn't what it looks like. She seemed embarrassed as if trying to explain something. Whatever it is. I don't care. Were you acting like a creep? I dash stop acting like a creep and stalking. 
If anyone is gonna be a stalker here, it's gotta be me. I hate other people stalking. Ah, she seemed to come to a realization as she looked down. Seems like I misunderstood that. Why did I even think you would do things the way normal people would? I was going to throw her in one of the clean water puddles. If she didn't come to her senses soon. At least if she was going to spy on me, then do a better job. It wouldn't have worked due to the map, but it's the thought that counts. Soccer. Look we made a canal. One of the children, a young boy with a wide smile, tattered clothes, and thin body smiled at me. Ha ha ha. I never knew bending could be used like this and help people. The other children, most of whom were orphaned or had been abandoned by their parents, looked at me with happy smiles. Smiling back, I decided to reward them for today. Yes, you've all done a good job. Let's go to the Flying Pig and get a good meal. The Flying Pig was a high-end restaurant owned by the Bifong family. And it wasn't like I was manipulating the situation to make me look good in the eyes of a certain someone. Quest. Cleaning the slums, 38% completed also. I have been making some good progress on that quest. The item rewards were good, so I decided to take it while waiting. When we arrived there, the manager seemed to recognize some of the slum kids, even though they were wearing better clothes, and an enraged look came across his face. But before he could say anything, I gave him a pouch of money. Since I had become quite rich due to stealing from Fire Nation strongholds in the past, keep the change. I winked and nodded. Of course, my lord, this way, he led us all cordially toward one of the bigger tables that seemed to be made of marble. The restaurant itself wasn't too busy. But it wasn't surprising, except for the beefons who could afford to eat here. As we ordered a food, the entrance door opened revealing the people I had been waiting for. It was quite lucky to meet them so soon, on the first try, even though I was prepared to come here every night until meeting them. It didn't take long for Toph to get a hang of metal bending, showing that while she might be blind, she made up for such a weakness, by being the most talented earthbender alive. But as she was morphing dozens of chunks of metal in her room into different shapes, a bead of sweat rolled down her cheek. Not having a lot of exciting things to do in her life, Toph usually spent it training and learning more about the new art of metal bending. Knock knock suddenly, two soft knocks landed on her door, and Toph, who had been too preoccupied with metal bending, used her sensory ability to see who it was. Young lady, the soft feminine voice of one of the servants rang out. Your mother has told me to remind you to get ready. Do you need help? No, Toph said. Until lately, servants would dress her up. But after telling her mother that she had memorized the places of her clothing she wanted to try it herself. I will put on the clothes myself. If there is anything out of place, then you can tell me in the end. She wore her usual nice clothes and tied up her hair in a nice bundle. Looking at the mirror in her room, Toph sighed. She somewhat knew what she looked like, but was unable to see it for real. This blindness had made her who she is, so she wasn't too bothered by it. Will I always live like this, until I get old? In a prison of pity from my parents, Toph muttered, a strange feeling blossoming in her heart. The strange young man's words came to mind, and how he seemed to know quite a lot. Even though he wasn't an earthbender, he somehow knew more about it than her, and was able to correctly theorize metal bending. Toph's hand twitched and from under her bed, a crumble of metal came out. It was the size to comfortably fit in her small hands. Having the metal float in front of her hand, she changed its shape into that of a human, or more correctly, the shape of the man who had helped her reach this level of bending. Hiding the figurine in her robes, the door to her room opened and her mother came in. Oh, Toph, you look so cute. Your memory is also quite good to be able to remember where your clothes are placed. My little girl is a genius. She came and hugged Toph with a delighted smile on her face, and from the vibrations on the ground, Toph could tell how much her mother cared about her. This was also one of the reasons why she had a hard time leaving her home, or running away because she could do so whenever she wanted. But knowing that her parents would worry, and loved her so much she was hesitant. When dinner time came around, her family went out for dinner, which it did so each month. A small army of earthbenders and warriors followed them as they went towards one of the famous local restaurants they owned, The Flying Pig. A three-story restaurant with lanterns all around the building. The light that came out of the building was so bright that it made it seem as if it was blessed by the sun. This place is pretty as always, the best establishment in the Earth Kingdom. Even nobles from all around the world want to come here and visit it. Toph's father told a story about how it was made, something that she had heard thousands of times now, as they got closer to the establishment. Every time they came here, he would always say it with such enthusiasm as if it was his first time. Even her mother found it annoying. But she kept her usual smile during the whole story. Toph didn't know why she would do that. If her mother said something, then her father would stop talking about the story. What a weird woman suddenly. Just as they were about to enter, Toph stopped just outside of the door. Her father immediately noticed this, and he stopped his story. Toph, he looked at her. Are you okay? Her mother, who was holding her hand to guide the blind girl through the streets, also glanced at her daughter. Dear, is something wrong? Her mother inquired. The worried voice made it clear that she was distressed and Toph didn't need her earth sensory ability to tell that much. No. Toph then started walking with her parents. 
but she could still tell that they were worried. Any of her small actions could be interpreted by her parents in a way that worried them. Imagine how they would react if she decided to go and fight in the war against the Fire Nation. Also, her father was secretly funding some of the Fire Nation expeditions, so they wouldn't hurt his business too. So Toph knew that even if everyone else was afraid of the Fire Nation, her father sponsored both sides. So no matter who won, the Bifong family would come out on top. If something like this became public then the family would be ruined. But Toph knew that there were some things she mustn't say. As they entered, the place was even more mesmerizing inside than outside. Granite table, luxurious chairs, and beautiful waiters with traditional uniforms. Toph wasn't preoccupied with any of this, and instead acted like she didn't notice the man with many children who were orphans, judging by their demeanor as they feasted on a giant table. While Dash Lord Bifong, a loud exclamation suddenly rattled through the restaurant getting everyone's attention. Her father clenched his fist in annoyance even though there was a smile on his face. But the yeller didn't seem to get the memo. The manager of the flying pig rushed towards her father and bowed down like a dog. My lord, if I had known you were coming. The manager's slimy eyes glanced towards the big table with laughing children and the man helping them. The manager had only let them in because the man had paid an astronomical amount of money. But with the lord here, it wasn't worth losing his job. I will take care of this, Lord Bifong. The overweight manager with a small moustache was about to walk towards the table that was unsightly for a lord. But her father put a hand on the man's shoulder, stopping him. Don't do something like that if they've paid. Then the customers, her father insisted sternly. Slowly a smile appeared on his face as he glanced towards the table. Also, it isn't like we get to meet such an interesting person every day. As they approached the table, the man turned to look at them and smiled. Oh, Lord Bifong, I almost didn't recognize you. Have we met before? No, but the name Lao Bifong and your appearance is well known throughout the Earth Kingdom. It would be weirder if I somehow didn't know about you. Sokka added the friendly smile from him was infectious, as Toph's father smiled too. Lao Bifong could tell that the young man in front of him was someone interesting. The kind of person that you might meet only once in your lifetime. Since you know me already, I seem to be at a disadvantage of not knowing your name. Sokka, just Sokka, he said his voice had a strange attractiveness to it. That made anyone listening want to be his friend. Sokka mentioned towards the orphans. I decided to reward them with a good meal, as they've helped me a lot. Hope there isn't any problem with that. Lao Bifong suddenly felt a strange chill go down his spine. Even when meeting the most dangerous kind of people to do business with, he never felt this. Was it the cold wind? He wondered, deciding to dismiss such a feeling for now. No, not at all. I am delighted to have your company here, and glad to see someone show kindness to children. Lao Bifong smiled, his brown eyes meeting Sokka's inviting blue ones. Do you mind if we take the table next to you? I would love to hear what stories someone like you has to tell. Sokka nodded in agreement. Sure. But my stories aren't that interesting. I'm just another guy traveling through the road of life, trying to help as many people as I can while at the same time fulfilling my dreams. Contrary to what you might think, that sounds interesting. Lao Bifong remarked. Looking at his guards he ordered them. Don't let any high-ranking officials or nobility come to interrupt our conversation. Yes, Lord Bifong, one of the men, his uniform was more defined than others, clasped his hands and immediately went to work. He was the captain of the Earthbender Guard for the Beifong family, and also Toph's Earthbending teacher. You say that you don't have interesting stories, but how about the story of how you came to help these children? Inquired Lao Bifong. That sounds very interesting to me. His family took their seats on a table to the right of Sokka. The young man smiled, a light of amusement glittering in his eyes. I just wanted to fix certain things within this beautiful town. For example, in the slums, there is a lot of criminal activity there. So I had to fix that before it developed even more. Lao Bifong nodded, not showing what he was thinking outwardly. Is he trying to fix corruption? That's quite naive of him. Do you think good deeds can fix the bad? It might sound plausible on paper. But humans are creatures of endless greed. The slums will always exist no matter what. Of course, such thoughts, Lao Bifong made sure to now show outwardly. A waiter brought his family some tea in elegant, golden decorated cups. There was no need to even ask what kind of tea they wanted, because the manager was quite thorough with his research. That was one of the main reasons he was the manager in The Flying Pig, even though his demeanor was quite kiss-ass and annoying. Well, the situation of the slums has intrigued many governors and nobles through the ages. Lao Bifong chose his words carefully, not wanting to ruin a newly made friendship. Not that he cared about it too much, but as a businessman, one had to keep their relationships stable. Sokka seemed like the kind of guy that would go far in the world. Maybe not far in political power, but he had a demeanor that attracted people. It was something Lao Bifong judged that only those of pure heart had and couldn't be copied by someone like a scheming businessman. Sokka took a sip of the expensive orange juice or whatever it was, this world had some fruits that he wasn't too sure about. Even most of the animals were crossbreeds between the animals and his first world. Though there are some animals like cats, and some others that he has found are still the same. Lao Bifong was strange. Sokka couldn't try and scheme this, as Toph would be angry if he scanned her father or anything like it. People thrive in the challenge. That's when you get to give it your all. 
and show that you're worthy of what you have. Some people even went out there and sought to challenge themselves. Sokka wasn't one of them. He didn't want to live his life too on the edge, but he knew when to sharpen his knives. But still, people made mistakes throughout their lives. It was an inevitable fact. No one was born with experience in life well, normally that is. Sokka was an exception to this. While his gamer interface gave him an advantage in life, only by knowing how to use such power and be cautious, could he truly get the full benefits. Having an intelligent mind was like a calculator. Without someone knowing how to use it, then it's just a piece of junk. Life experience was a good thing. One of the cheat tricks of life, it's sad that you have to sacrifice your youth to get it. Sokka shook his head dismissing such thoughts in his mind and addressed Toph's father. Lord Bifong. He contemplated what to say next, in order not to offend the Bifong family head. Sometimes you just have to flex your power and be willing to go to their level. That way, if you're strong enough, most things fall into place easier. For example, with the Bifong family name, isn't it easier to make deals than some unknown merchant? Because the family name itself carries weight, that too can be considered a kind of power. He needed Toph, the greatest earthbender, with him. Yumi was another option, but he didn't trust the wise old man that much. Yumi knew what it was to make sacrifices, just like he sacrificed his monarchy for the greater good. Sokka didn't want to be another sacrifice in that cycle. So what if the old man wanted Sokka to be someone who would be like a general, leading An's army in the resistance against the Fire Nation? That plan had died as soon as he had decided to put Ezra on the throne. If it wasn't beneficial to him, or lead to something beneficial at least, Sokka wasn't going to do something he didn't want to. He loved Bumi as a character in the show, but in reality, he couldn't afford to make mistakes. I know what you mean, but the Bifong family has cultivated this power for many generations now. What about you? Do you have the required power to deal with this? Inquired Lao Bifong, curiously. He didn't believe in Sokka. Why would he? After all, the young man was just a stranger that spoke big. But at least he was entertaining to see. So Lao Bifong didn't dismiss him yet. Sokka smiled, drawing the water out of a glass, and showing it to Lao, as the liquid slowly took shape into the form of three humans. A man, woman, and small child. Do you know why people turn to crime? Sokka answered the question with a question of his own. To people high up, crimes might seem like something criminals have in their blood. But those same criminals are also human, and have their own emotions. Suddenly, Lao, as a fairly intelligent man, came to his conclusion too. Nobody does crimes for fun. Sokka nodded, smiling happily. Yeah! That isn't how the world works, as some people do it for fun. But I need to paint this semi-truthful story. The world is filled with crazy people, and sometimes some even put a certain glory to crime. For example, honorable jewels ended up with someone dead. But since it had the word honor attached to it, that became something more than just murder. While Sokka's beliefs may differ from his words, when lies become sprinkled with a pinch of truth, they become indistinguishable from it. I am glad that you understand, sir, Sokka nodded as his gaze sharpened. That's how I will solve the slum problem. I will take care of people in a way that no one needs to resort to crime. And I will kill anyone who differs from my suggestion. I was going to fix the problem and any uncontrollable people. The ones who did detestable cries. I won't waste time on them, and they will be killed behind the scenes. While Sokka's actions might seem charitable, he still held selfish prospects in his mind. Still, that didn't make a good deed bad. If a politician donated to a charity for public support, would that make his good actions bad, just because he had hidden agendas? That was a thought for the philosophers, and Sokka didn't consider himself one. Though his mind did wonder sometimes when he had leisure time. I will help you, Lao Bifong declared, and Sokka caught a whiff of the greed behind the man's gaze. But I didn't mind it that much. As long as their goals were in parallel positions, without interfering with each other, then helping the other was beneficial for both. Why ruin a good thing? While I wasn't after Bifong's sponsorship, I wouldn't refute having it either. This should somewhat help me later on with logistics and paying the fighters. Sokka knew that fighting in a war wasn't just having a strong warrior go in and do their thing. If that warrior wasn't fed, paid, and had his family's security insured, then why would he fight for you? Some people didn't know better so they would fight anyways. But that wasn't the case most of the time. Every person in an army had a mind of their own, and something they wanted out of this war. While Sokka had used that fact to his advantage against the Fire Nation before, he knew that the same problem would sprout in his army too. That was why he needed to be careful, or have someone be solely concentrated on that. Azala is someone who seems like a good choice, but she is more of a leader too. Iro wouldn't join him, due to Zuko. Many of the people in this world who were good at this, and appeared in the original show, were unlikely to join Sokka. Well, for now, it isn't a problem as Sokka can do the managing himself, since he didn't necessarily need sleep. But still, he didn't want to work so hard. Sokka found it more efficient to use the time he would have spent managing menial tasks elsewhere. I am thankful for your help, Lord Bifong. But what would your help entail exactly? Just so I can be more prepared for it. Trust me, the rich man smiled. Endorsements from the Bifong family are quite satisfying. Sokka didn't doubt that, knowing that the family had a reputation to keep. Toph on the other hand just observed the situation from the sidelines. She didn't interfere between the business talk of her father and Sokka. But she knew one thing, and that was that Sokka wasn't as naive as her father seemed to think he is, and that made her cautious. Still, even if she wanted to warn her father, 
it would be almost useless, since he would just dismiss her. What did a blind know about people? She had been sheltered most of her life and was just a child in her father's eyes. After the time spent at the Flying Pig restaurant, Sokka was quite satisfied with how things ended up. While Lao Bifon had just given his word, for now, Sokka knew that the promise was worth his weight in gold. But as he walked back home after escorting all of the children home, nothing happened to them. His danger sense skill warned him of something, and his body knew what to do before his mind even caught up. Fwish. A stone flew right past his head, looking at it. He noticed that it had a pointy end. Looking back at the attacker, stood Toph. She was still wearing the dress that she wore for dinner. But unlike before, her expression now didn't suit her. Sokka smiled at her. Were you just testing me if I had some kind of sensory ability like you? Because that means that you're trying to see how I would fight if it came down to it. Then after attacking me, you would try and play it off as a joke. Of course, this is just an assumption. Oh wow, look at the innocent guy acting all smart, Toph snorted sarcastically. I don't know who you are, but if you try anything with my family, I will hunt you down. What Sokka acted mock surprised, and knew Toph could tell as her frown deepened. But I taught you metal bending. I thought that would make a relationship at least stable. Toph didn't express anything outwardly that she didn't want him to know. But Sokka knew her better than she knew herself. Who are you? Sokka shrugged. Who am I? Well, who is everyone? We discover what we are while living. I can't change what I am to other people. Also, have you ever thought about being the Avatar's teacher? Toph only frowned and didn't answer. Sokka could guess why her reaction was like this. After all, she was used to sensing when people are lying and can tell when someone is being truthful. But he was different, with her sensing being useless, she can't see his face to tell what he was thinking either. Sokka knew that, and that was why he was so willing to meet her and talk so much. If he didn't have Gamer's body, or she was able to read him, he would have shut up and just gone with the origin's development in the story or something similar if he could. She probably wants to know why I'm doing this. Sokka analyzed, his mind working fast to come up with a solution. Come to the outskirts of the town entrance if you want to learn more. After saying that, Sokka walked away and didn't say anything anymore, as Toph was just left there, standing in the dark, with the moon shining on her white dress. On the outskirts of Jailing, a large town surrounded by mountains, Sokka stood atop one of the trees. He kept throwing it up and counting in his head until it landed. This was something he had been doing a lot to see how the law of physics worked in this world. He sighed and got up. By now a couple of hours had passed since he had last talked with Toph, and while he was confident that she would come, he also knew that nothing in life was certain. So he was about to go to the hotel room he had rented. It seems like I need a new plan to have her approach me. ECH, this is harder than I thought it would initially be. But as he opened the map to check where she was, to his surprise he found her under ground and this came as a nice surprise to him and with that he laid back down waiting for her this was going to be a long night hours passed and the morning light shone Toph, who was underground also woke up and frowned as she sensed that Sokka was still up there waiting for her he didn't seem perturbed as he went and made a camp lighting some fire and cooking some birds he caught by using his spear as a projectile she couldn't read him at all not only that but his actions were strange there was no logic around them at least that was how she saw it which unnerved Toph a little but she didn't know what the familiar feeling bursting inside of her was. It felt like the time she fought in her first Earth Rumble tournament. Excitement poured through her veins as she encountered someone mysterious. It made her wonder if this was how it felt when people were reading mystery books. Should I go up there and meet with him? Maybe make an excuse why I couldn't come yesterday evening. Toph tried to think up a way to approach the situation. She wasn't used to this as in conversations she either was the one in charge, like in the Earth Rumble tournament or her identity as the only child in the Bifong family protected her from the problems. Still, having him wait in the cold night all alone made her feel a heaviness in her heart and she finally relented, coming above ground, finding him cooking a bird over the fire. The sight of him doing that made her feel sorry for him. Oh, you showed up, Sokka said casually. Want some strange bird I caught. Slight warning, it might be poisonous. But you know how it is, live life experiencing the unexpected. Toph stared at him for a couple of seconds, while stare was an overstay. But more like her head is turned toward his general direction. You are so weird, Toph said with a tired sigh. But she still sat down next to him and flicked her hand. The sound of rocks clattering and a weird rabbit wolf flew in the air. It had the body of a rabbit, but the head of a wolf. Its fur was nice, soft and gentle. While its head was ferocious, this one has a little more meat to it. Sokka nodded. Yeah. You're right. Also, that sensory ability is really useful. I know, Toph smoked triumphantly. It's the best. So, do you sense it when someone is doing things? As you know when your parents are doing the business. Do you sense that too? She wanted to punch him as soon as he asked that. If you want your life intact, you should stop asking that. Okay. Sokka nodded, skinning the rabbit wolf. He opened his mouth to say something but closed it back again, thinking of something. Hum, your ability is intriguing. So can you sense projectiles? Yeah, most of them Toph felt that he was about to ask another question, but decided to change it at the last second. Though sometimes projectiles become hard to sense, but by the movements of the earth, I can dash she suddenly stopped herself, 
and her eyes narrowed in suspicion. Why would you want to know that? Planning to see which way of attack would work better against me? No, he lightly shook his head. But if we're being fair here, you tried the same thing last night, attacking me out of nowhere. Also if you want to know, my sensory ability works depending on how dangerous an attack is. Though it's a little confusing even to me in the details. Sometimes I can't even sense some attacks. Sokka stared at the fire as if remembering something. While the delicious smell of the cooking meat permeates the air, Toph knew he was hiding certain part of his ability. But she knew when to not ask things like this. Why did you help me? Toph asked, feeling like something was missing. Something she wasn't understanding in this situation. It was more of a gut feeling. I want you, Sokka said resolutely, looking her in the eyes. Earthbending of your level and talent. It would be a shame if you continued living in such a closed environment. Your potential is endless. Why waste it in such a small place? You're really selfish, Toph concludes. Like the most selfish guy I've ever met, she slowly smiles. If you want someone, you don't care what they want but only how far they can take your ambition. Yes, you're right. I am very selfish and will make people do what I want. Sokka chuckles. That's why you have to be selfish too. It's your life or else people like me will come around and try to use you for our benefit. Sokka didn't hide his selfishness from her and made sure to put it on a platter. Later on, she could realize what he was doing. So he was preparing for that. It was inevitable anyway. Hey, you're right. Then I will be selfish, Toph declared. Getting up and pointing at Sokka. I want to run away from home. But at the same time, make sure that my parents aren't worried. Also, make sure that they don't hate me. Her requests were absurd, she wanted to do whatever she wanted in life without any consequence, without sacrificing anything. This isn't how things work. But Sokka's smile only widened at her declaration. Well, it seems like I have my work cut out for me. What a greedy comrade I have, though his words sounded insulting. The smile on his face told a different story. That's why we will be perfect in working with each other. People need to have a certain greed in their hearts to be happy. They need to achieve something or want something. Sokka wasn't any different. He understood that every human had greed, and wasn't going to take that from the people who joined him. No, instead he will help them accomplish their dreams. After eating some of the rabbit wolf meat, Toph left not long after that. Sokka was left behind thinking of how to complete her request. He had even gotten a quest for it. The rewards weren't that special. Well, they were good, but Sokka had already gotten many good things from quests. So he refused this one as he didn't want the experience points for now. A system built to level up the player. I will overturn that and make this thing my own. Sokka too has his greed. He likes the gamer interface and he will make it his own. The creator of this thing must have imprinted many risks upon himself to create such power too. In this world, Sokka wasn't into too much of a rush to level up as he had already acquired strength in which he felt comfortable. For now, he didn't want to make that unknown enemy stronger. Usually, he wouldn't call people his enemy. He was the kind of guy who prided himself in seeing things from both sides of the fence. But this hidden, system-creating force was something that he couldn't call anything less than an enemy. One of them had to die during this encounter. For now, I might not be the strongest existence in the Avatar world. Far from it but I am still somewhat comfortable in my power. As long as I don't act stupid, things shouldn't develop into a phase I can't handle. With a sigh, Sokka got up and put the leftover meat in his inventory, erasing any trace of its existence. He walked back to town, his calm gaze looking onward as his mind wandered trying to think of a plan in which Toph's parents would be happy to let their daughter go. This is quite impossible to achieve. With how overprotective they are, how the hell will I achieve that? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.